So, Madam Chair, if you're ready. I am ready. Uh, are we on? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, I would like to call the 5.30 regular session of the Palm Springs Planning Commission of September 1st, 2021 to order. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Elaine? Present. Commissioner Urban? Present. Commissioner Hirschbein? Present. Commissioner Maruzzi? Here. Commissioner Song? Present. Vice Chair Roberts? Present. Chair Wormack? Present. We have a quorum. Can I have a report on the uh, posting of the agenda, please? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, the agenda was posted on Thursday, August 26th, and our meeting has been posted in accordance with state law. Thank you. Um, at this point, I, can I have a motion to accept the agenda? So moved. Um, Madam Chair, I, I would add that I need to recuse and pull some things from the consent calendar. I, I'd like to add something to the consent calendar. Item 2B. 2B is... Uh, before we, I have an amendment to 2B before we add it to the consent calendar. Uh, Madam Chair, we can't add that to the consent calendar. It does require that we hold a public hearing just for that item. Thank you. We can keep that item short. Um, and it's just as well, Madam Chair, because that's the item I need to recuse from. I have I own property within the notification area. And I would like to pull um, item 1B uh, for a quick clarification um, on, on, our, on our minutes for that. It's 1A or 1B? It's, it's um, 1B actually. Um, it, our, our, our findings or our comments on that element, I, I see what I think is an error. And so I'd like to pull it so we can discuss that. Uh, you're talking about 1A in the minutes of July 21st? No, I'm talking about 1B. Okay. I want, I want to make a change on 1A. Um, oh, no. You know what, Madam Chair? You were right. Um, it is 1A. I'm sorry. So, and you, and nobody is pulling 1B. Correct? Oh, no. I'm sorry. I'm pulling 1B as well. I have questions about that as well. Okay. Can I have a, mo I have a motion on the acceptance of the agenda with changes from Commissioner Roberts? Do I have a second? Are the changes to remove 1A and 1B? We're not voting yet on the consent calendar, are we? <laughs> no, we're just we're just noting that we want a discussion on uh, what the the minutes of July twenty first for one A and one B is being pulled. And yes, and to confirm Mr. Maruzzi's uh, or to answer his question, yes, I am pulling one A as well. Um, the special minutes for a correction. So there is there are no other suggested changes to the agenda. I'll make the motion. Second. Do I have a second? Yes. We'll second. We, we have member our Vice Chair Roberts as the first. Mr. Hirschbein, were you seconding the motion? I'll second, I'll second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 That passes unanimously. Uh, at this point, it's a time for public comments. This time has been set aside for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on consent calendar and other agenda items and items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the commission. Please note that uh, we're prohibited from taking action on items that are not listed in the agenda. 
Each minute, each, uh, three minutes will be allowed for each speaker. Testimony for public hearings may be offered at this time or at the hearing. Members who would like to comment on 1A, 1B, 3A, and 4A are directed to comment under this section. Uh, do we have members of the public who would like to comment? Yes, Madam Chair, we have two people who have specifically called to, re to speak, uh, requested to speak at this time. Uh, Corinne Griswold is the first speaker, followed by Howard Hyman. And if any additional people want to speak, please let me know either in the chat or by raising your hand in the reactions feature on Zoom. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Sh should I begin speaking now? Yes, please. Please Hi. identify yourself. I'm Corinne Griswold. Um, I just retired from 37 years of teaching at Raymond Cree Middle School was the last school. And my husband and I have lived in G the Gene Autry neighborhood on San Antonio Road for since um, 1977, so a long time. And um, thank you for letting me speak. Um, We've really enjoyed living here. We're just concerned about the new Serena Park development. And thank you for letting me talk now. I'm in New Jersey visiting my daughter. But, um, so for the time difference, we're, we're concerned about the increase in traffic. That's been the biggest difference in our neighborhood. When I first moved here, there were three other houses on the street. And now at certain times in the morning and the evening, it's hard to get off my street and to Via Escuela because of the traffic. And I'm just concerned with the Serena Park development coming and it would almost double the number of houses in Gene Autry. Um, and most of it is going to be emptying onto um, Verona, and um, and we're afraid it'll be affecting the Escuela. So we would like, I would really like a, a third entrance. So it's not all the traffic is dumping onto streets that are already overcrowded. I'm especially worried about kids who still live in the neighborhood. In fact, the street behind me has a sign up caution children at play and the house across from me has a lot of kids could they have a, a daycare there during the day but they also have some kids who live there um, it seems i've looked at the maps for the serena park development and i don't think it would be um, impossible to have a third exit um, I'm no traffic engineer, but it seems pretty obvious that Serena Park residents who would want to get somewhere in Palm Springs quicker are going to head to Whitewater Drive and Verona Road. That's going to put so much additional traffic on Gene Austry streets. And, you know, when traffic backs up, people are going to start turning off and going through the whole neighborhood looking for faster ways to get out. I'm asking you as a long-term proud resident of Gene Autry um, neighborhood in Palm Springs to please make sure the developers put in a third exit entrance to take some of the additional traffic off our streets. Um, it would make it a lot safer for people going to work and also for the kids who live here. Thank you so much. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Howard Hyman. Hi, my name is uh, Howard Hyman. I am speaking regarding the proposed construction next to me at 585 Camino Caladad. The design submitted has a below dwelling garage. The desire to have this feature has caused this project to be to come before you tonight for a height variance, claiming significant burdens to remove substantial amounts of earth to accommodate the garage. If grading was going to be an issue, the dwelling should not have been designed as such. There is no precedent for an underdwelling parking garage where a substantial amount of earth had to be moved. The few cases of underdwelling parking nearby were placed on the lot in an area where the terrain naturally permits a lower garage without, with, sorry, with minimal grading. By providing the underdwelling parking, you may be setting a precedent for other homes and developers wanting to create more underdwelling garages. This would generate additional dust and become a civil nuisance during construction. 
We do not want this as a legacy issue in the city. Please do not set precedent for this type of garage. Secondly, the property includes a rooftop deck. There are no rooftop decks in this area of the city on a residential property. The views from the pool area of this project are spectacular at ground level. There's nothing to be gained by adding a rooftop deck other than to create a nuisance for the neighbors. It is located above the casino towards the rear of the property. I do not believe the deck gives them any meaningful views to the Coachella Valley as these views would likely be occluded by the roof of the main house. The deck is being built with an orientation to look at the mountain view that is visible from the pool deck below. I essentially have the same view of the mountain from my house without needing a rooftop deck. Therefore, in this circumstance, the only thing a rooftop deck is good for is to create a nuisance, a visual nuisance if a canopy is added, or if cafe lights are strung, or if a DJ or live music is used for a pool party at a station on top of the deck. Without being built, it's already a nuisance with the neighbors concerned about privacy. A rooftop deck does not materially improve views. For the owners of this lot, it can only create a problem. The only thing a rooftop deck can do is to become a nuisance. Now that the design has been allowed to progress to this point, and if the house is not going to be redesigned to be smaller overall and remove the underdwelling parking, which appears unlikely at this point, would be to have a trade-off of accepting the staff recommendation in exchange for removing the rooftop deck. I believe you have the authority to negotiate these types of trade-offs. Again, the only thing a rooftop deck can do is to become a nuisance. Thank you for your time, and I apologize if this is a re reiteration for too many of you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I see a number of you have also requested to speak during the public hearing for Serena Park. So if you wish to provide your comment now, instead of when the public hearing is for Serena Park, you may do so, but you won't have the opportunity to speak at the public hearing for Serena Park. Um, so you can uh, speak now or during the hearing for the item. Uh, our next speaker is Lance O'Donnell. Yeah, good evening. Uh, I'm representing the Dyer residents. It's item 3A on the agenda this evening. Uh, I would like to request some additional time to speak on specific documents that we were asked to provide this evening. So um, is that Mr. a possibility? Mr. O'Donnell, can you uh, stay with us? And I'll ask you to speak during the item. Okay, thank and you, Madam Chair. Presentation, it'll, it'll be more helpful at that point in time. Okay, so it looks like the remaining people requesting to speak will be speaking during the public hearing item for Serena Park. Um, but if I'm incorrect, please let us know now and unmute yourself and identify yourself, please. Looks like, looks like that concludes public comment, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, moving to cons the consent calendar. Uh, first, I'm going to pull the minutes on item um, 1A, it's the approval of the minutes of July 14th and July 21st. There was a request to pull the minutes of July 21st. Uh, that's Commissioner Roberts. I also have a request to change for um, July 14th. Uh, and I also have some comments about the 21st of July. If I can be allowed to address those after Mr. Roberts. Okay, can, um, would have been good to know about the 14th before, but let's start there. Um, Madam Chair, my, my change um, or correction is actually related to the July 21st minutes. This is I'm going to I'm gonna start with the 14th and then move to the 21st. Commissioner Maruzzi. Yeah, isn't this typically the time that we can make our comments about minutes? I mean, I thought this is generally the time we do so. Oh, I, we would normally not pull them unless you'd requested us to, but if you'd make comments on it, please do. 
on page uh, five of the July 14th minute, the second paragraph, it, it says, Vice Chair Maruzzi said in general, he's in favor of gates, particularly on the main road. I'm not in favor of gates, particularly on the main road. So the not is pretty important in that paragraph. That's all for me. Uh, is, are there any other comments on this one? Uh, can, I'm going to make a motion to approve it with Commissioner Baruzzi's change on page five. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, July 21st, Commissioner Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. If uh, you go to um, item number three, three A, and you turn the page, um, it, this refers to our discussion and our provided comments to the city council and the staff on the housing element. And if you look at, uh, then uh, I guess it would be page 158, B, so it's the top of the second page or page four of the minutes. It says strengthen language and indicate, and then there's the word discourage hotel to apartment conversions. I think that's inaccurate. I don't think anybody suggested that unless I'm wrong. Uh, it seems to me- I, uh, Commissioner Roberts, I did suggest that. You I did suggested suggest that? To, yes, my suggestion was that we discourage conversion. Oh no, I'm so, I'm sorry. You're correct. I would want to um, <clears throat> encourage the conversion. That's what I remember. Um, so I, it's important that that line be struck. That we are actually encouraging, um, and from all our discussions, that's all I remember. Um, we are encouraging hotel to apartment conversions, certainly not discouraging them. What, what, where is that again? Uh... Um, so if you look at page four, my page four of those minutes, top of the page, um, it's, it's supposedly page 158 and then B. So HS2.9 says strengthen language and indicate, and then the word discourage hotel to apartment conversions. We do not want to do that. Okay, I see it. Thanks. Yep. Uh, Flynn, hopefully that didn't enter into the new draft. No, I think what the what the issue was, was relative to policy 2.9, which says ensure that proposals for conversion of apartments into condominiums are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis and that existing affordable units are not lost due to conversion. So by the way, specifically on that, what the commission did discuss was exactly that, discouraging, um, apart, yes. sorry, discouraging um, apartment to condo. Apartments yes. to condominiums. Essentially the goal here, if we want to add something, if it's not too late, is to encourage or preserve our apartment stock. Yeah. So I think we had that in error. I think if you're correct, it should have said uh, discourage apartment to convert to condominium conversions. But David, I hope that's clear about any conversion from um, uh, uh, about conversion from apartments to anything else. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had on that. Commissioner Hirschbein, you had a comment? Uh, yeah, well, I, I forwarded an email to the director earlier today because um, I had uh, listed a number of goals in preservation of undisturbed hillsides. I think I had, I don't know, a half a dozen or more different points that I wanted, to, uh, and uh, I read them off. There didn't seem to be any uh, disagreement among commissioners, and I was asked to send the list to staff, and I did that, and it didn't get included in the uh, in the minutes. And I want to make sure they are. And uh, I don't know if you want to read them again or just just to include them. Uh, Commissioner, 
Hirschfein, we have a copy of what you sent us earlier today, so I'm having Ms. Hintz uh, incorporate those as indicated on the tape. Okay. Um, and I'm only going from memory here because I, I do not have the document. I didn't save the document, unfortunately. But um, I spent quite a bit of time reviewing it, and I, I could be wrong about this, but I, I think some of my comments didn't make it into the minutes, but and that's sort of a general, and I don't know if you might want to review that. Yeah, we'll be happy to review the tape and make sure it's accurate. Thank you. But uh, more important than the tape is making sure the comments got into the draft that was sent to the state. And that would be important to review as well. So can we hold this? so that you're going to review the tape and see what should be included. And this, this will come back to us. Flynn, that would be my motion is that we, we don't approve these minutes until we, we, until you've reviewed the tape and included what should have been included in these, in this list. Yeah, that, that's that would be staff's recommendation to Madam Chair, just to ensure that we have captured the comments here tonight. So the I, I would take a motion to approve with Commissioner Maruzzi's amendment the minutes of July 14th, 2021, and to um we we've already taken action on that, uh, uh Madam Chair take an action on the first one and on the second, the minutes of July 21st, 2021, to review those at a date certain, which would be our next meeting, which is on September. And I don't, I'm, I think it's, am I right that it's the 24th or? 22nd. 22nd. So uh, for the second, it would be to, um, have that come back to us on September 22nd with corrections. So moved. I'll second that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Fine. And that's unanimous. Uh, the second is 1B, a request for a general plan conformity finding for the uh, finding for vacation of a public road and utility right of way within lot 27 of amended track map 18087 map book 16 uh, 62 dash 40 in section 26 township 4 range 4 east um, staff report do we need a staff report or Commissioner Roberts, do you have a quick? Madam Chair, I just have two quick questions for staff on this. If you'd like me to go ahead, I will. Please. So when we abandon or when we vacate a sizable portion of land to a private homeowner, two questions. Who in fact owns that land, the city of Palm Springs prior to its vacation? David, would you like me to jump in on that? Uh, I'll just respond quickly, and then if you want to elaborate on anything I missed, um, this easement and road uh, were not required, and so therefore that is why this is before the commission. Uh, under state law, the planning commission has to um, identify that this is not part of our plan, so the circulation plan, um, and so that's the reason why we're bringing it forward with the recommendation for approval, because the roadway um, that was recorded as part of this property back in the 50s is not part of our circulation element. Mr. Newell, I understand why it's before us. My question is, are we vacating an easement or a piece of land? This is an easement. Is that road already owned by that property owner, and is it just the easement that we're giving up? Correct. It is currently owned by the property owner. Okay, so we're only giving up the easement. So the property owner can now build over that land or do whatever it is he, he would normally do on any other part of his land. That's correct. It was identified as a road in the legal documents and easement. 
uh, but is not in fact owned by the city at this time. Excellent. So it's just the easement that we're vacating. Okay. Thank you. Did you have a second question? No, uh, the second request would only come if we were actually vacating land, that we were giving land over to the homeowner. Um, but if, if it's already owned by that individual and it's just the um, easement, I don't have any further questions. I would entertain a motion from you to approve this item. A move. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, can we have a roll call? Mr. Roberts? Yes. Commissioner Song? Yes. Commissioner Lane? Yes. Commissioner Irvin? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Maruzzi? Yes. Chair Wimmick? Yes. Thank you. The next item uh, is, uh, we are in public hearing. The next item is 2A, the City of Palm Springs for a zone text amendment to amend chapter 94.05 of the zoning code to allow residential densities on properties that have historically been permitted on hotel or commercial sites. Uh, the recommendation on this is to continue this to our next regular meeting of September 22nd, 2021. Can I have a motion to continue? So moved. Do we have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, moving right along. Um, This, the next item is 2B, Palm Springs Social Group, Inc. Uh, hyphen for a doing business as hyphen for a conditional use permit to allow New Palm Canyon Drive. Uh, can we have a staff report? And I would think we could possibly ask that this be a short staff report. Yes, Madam Chair. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Okay. So I need as to you switch uh, swap screen this one. Thank you. Is that better there? Yes. It's the same. You have both frames. Okay, um, Madam Chair, while I pull this up, the the applicant is um, looking to release a 960 square foot facility uh, located at um, a inline tenant space that includes three other tenants, a, um, a retail shop for uh, clothing, uh, and then a um, home store. Um, can you see it now? We see the two frames. Why don't we just go through it? That's okay. better. There we go. Okay. So as I mentioned, this is the um, the area of the uh, the store that will be rented. It is a wine shop, a wine and craft beer store. Uh, there'll be uh, a type twenty license, which is for takeout service only. So what they're proposing um, is to take the space that is between Seaplane and the Grace Home, which is the, uh, the white blacked out um, space right here that they wish to use as the, uh, the store. So this is the rear parking lot. Uh, there is 23 spaces that is located in the back of the, shop, uh, the center that will be used by uh, the tenants of this building. Uh, once again, this is number 1007. Uh, this shows the tenant space, the 960 square foot area that will be uh, leased for the wine and beer store. Um, remember, this is a, a high end store that is selling organic and craft beers. Uh, it's not a corporate store, uh, according to the applicant, and they'll be able to talk about the types of uses or the types of product that will be sold. 
Uh, the um, in, the interior of the floor uh, floor plan, which was in your packet, shows a series of racks that will be used to display merchandise, uh, a display table in the center, and then a small cooler that will be used for sparkling wines and beers that need to be kept chilled. Uh, and, and the, the parking that is proposed, as I mentioned, there are 23 spaces provided. Uh, they only need 21, so they're overparked. Uh, and this is will be a shared parking situation with the other uh, uses in the building. So our recommendation is that the findings for the CUP can be met uh, and approval with conditions. And that concludes my report, Chair. Are there questions for staff? I can't uh, speak up because I can't see all of you. I have one, two actually. Uh, one is I'm assuming PLN 10 is a mistake and that you're striking that. Right, that's correct. That will be um, corrected at the final uh, uh, resolution. And then a question for our attorney or the director. Uh, can we, in for PLN 1, can we uh, authorize this primarily for craft beer and organic wines so that we're, we're indicating the specialty of this shop and that the CUP couldn't just be transferred to another wine and beer store? That is a condition that we can add to the, we can make it more specific. Good. Okay. I have no other questions. Seeing no questions, uh, the applicant has 10 minutes. I'm opening the public hearing. The public will have three minutes. Um, and then the applicant will have three minutes for rebuttal. Is the applicant here? Yes. Hi. If you introduce yourself. Hi. Sure. Hi, my name is John Libinati, and I am the owner of Hyphen uh, Wine Shop. Um, the wines that I'm going to be presenting in the shop are, um, at the bare minimum, organic, mostly biodynamically grown. Um, all craft beer will be organic as well. Um, most consumers are not familiar with natural wines. Uh, most consumers assume that wine itself is a natural product, but don't understand that there could be over 200 chemicals in that bottle of wine, especially if they're buying something that is marked in the $4 range at very famous big box stores. Um, and these chemicals can range from things that are very close to hair conditioner to um, tartaric acid, citric acid, to basically make the product as palatable as possible. Natural wines are basically wines that are crushed grapes and there is zero manipulation done to make the wine taste a specific way to meet a current trend in palate. Um, my background in this is I used to own a wine shop in Boston for almost seven years, and it was an entirely natural wine shop. It became Boston's best wine shop after being open for 18 months in an area of Boston called South Boston, which people laughed at me for opening a natural wine shop in South Boston. They said, if I wanted to do anything, I should just open up a Bud shop, a Budweiser shop. And it's like, no, that's not what I want to do. My passion doesn't lie in Budweiser. My passion lies in these small family farmers that produce these wines that are not in big distributors' hands. They're in these tiny, small distributors who are actually out in the fields with these producers, going through their vineyards, inspecting their vineyards, looking to see if they're grown organically or biodynamically. A lot of them don't get certified because it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to get certification. So I trust in the distributors, these small distributors. Plus I do a ton of research on my own when I'm tasting with these distributors. I don't just buy wine just because I like the taste of it. I will go back and I'll research, I'll Google earth map the vineyards to see if they're actually living vineyards, that they're not just these pretty green vines. And if you see all this beige, dirty soil underneath them, you know that they're probably not organic, that they're sprayed with a ton of pesticides. But if you see life in the vineyard, if you see grass growing between the vines, underneath the vines, you see animals in the vines, you know that these producers are probably organic, if not biodynamic, especially if you see animals in the vines. Um, it's, it's a really interesting time right now because most consumers also don't realize that grapes are the highest, get the highest dose of synthetic 
pesticides next to citrus fruit. So, and it's been shown to show up actually in the product itself and sometimes even higher than what is required in the EU drinking water. We've seen pesticides. There's companies that will test these wines and test water and compare them back and forth and see pesticides higher in wine than they do in the actual water that a lot of the EU or UK are drinking right now. Um, and this is something that was very successful for me. And when I moved here two years ago with my husband, I was looking before then at space because we knew we eventually wanted to move here and our plan was to retire here. But I said, you know what? I want to enjoy my time here now at this age than in my retirement. And I decided I wanted to open a natural wine shop after not finding natural wines here in Palm Springs. There is a small bar that has a few that sells retail in a small section out of their bar. Um, but there's nobody that focuses on this. Um, and I got really tired walking through supermarkets and stores and seeing consumers wander aimlessly looking at these bottles and thinking, what should I buy? What should I buy? And there's no one there to talk to them. No one explains the wines to them. There's no one that says, hey, this is by a small family farmer. And I've actually met these people. I've been to their vineyards. I know this wine. This wine is X, Y, or Z and usually has a good backstory to it. Um, all the wines will be hand sold by myself and my staff that I intend to hire. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I got into this was just for health reasons. Most of these wines have zero to very low sulfites in them. And the body doesn't process sulfites as quickly as it processes other things that it needs to process, especially when it comes to alcohol, because the body wants to get rid of the alcohol first and then the sulfites after. So when people say, oh, I wake up with a hangover, it's probably from drinking cheap wine that is loaded with sulfites. Producers that make those wines, they are picking them throughout the entire day, no matter what the temperature is, no matter what time of day. And they're just going into a giant tank that's going to get hauled back to the winemaking facility where they're actually sulfited while they're picking so that the grapes don't start to ferment out in the field. The producers I know and love and will carry, these people are picking these vines by hand, these grapes by hand. They're not using machines. They're even using ox to plow their fields when they do have to plow. Most don't plow because their soils are so fresh and alive and have living organisms still in the soil that there is no need, that the rainfall comes and it just goes into the ground instead of being washed away. Uh, so my intention is to hand sell all these wines to people and I yet to come across anyone in Palm Springs that is doing this or talks to you when you're in a shop, you get a hello, but that's about as far as it goes. <clears throat> um, and my background started about in 2000 and I'd say nine when I was studying for my master of wine, I opened my shop in 2011 and couldn't finish my master of wine project. And I met a woman named Isabel Legeron, who is a France's first master of wine. She turned me on to natural wines after I was thinking all my life that, oh, wine is a natural product. It has to be natural. It's just fermented grape juice. And from there, um, I would go to her wine fairs and I would meet these, these incredible farmers who have their hands in the dirt every day. When you see them, they're pouring wines for you. You could see that their hands are all beat up and rugged and some still even have dirt under their fingernails because they've just come. John, can, can you address the operation? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, as in as your time runs down, you need to. Okay. <laughs> all right. uh, yeah, I can get on a soapbox about this for a very long time. Uh, the operations will be around from 10 a.m. to 8 a.m., 8 p.m., sorry, and then 9 on the weekends or it's Friday and Saturday. Uh, I intend to have one to two people, myself and another person as a staff member. Uh, I plan on doing uh, as much as I can within the community, getting people excited about this. Um, I don't understand how much more you need to know about operations on, uh, we plan to be open seven days a week. My neighbors are Grace Home and Seaplane, and I'm excited to be in that group with them and work with them together, especially Grace Home. Since there is some sunlight that does hit into the shop, I've been working with them about doing displays in front of the shop in the side to uh, take up space where I can't put wine. Great, thank you. And I believe there was also a mention of 
previously somebody had told me about singles for beer. Um, I would like to ask that I can carry singles for beer and uh, the f having it written into the CUP about not carrying a big bulk brand and having just biodynamic organic wines, I'm all for that. Um, I would like to carry singles because a lot of the organic and craft beer producers do make a lot of their beers that don't come in a six pack, they'll come in a 16 ounce bottle. And that is how they are packaged. And I would hate to sell a six pack of 16 ounce bottles. <laughs> Uh, are there other members of the public that wish to speak on this item? There being none, we're coming back to you for rebuttal. Uh, you have three minutes for rebuttal. And if you have three minutes that you want to present, otherwise, if you'd stay here and we can ask you questions. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, are there other, I have a question. Are there other members of the commission that have questions? What I would like to do um, is to write wine tasting into your CUP. I know you need to get another permit for that, but I wouldn't want right. you to have to come back for a second CUP. So thank you. So that's something that you would like us to do. I, I'm assuming you're not opposed to that. No, not at all. Eventually that was in the business plan to get there at some point. And I just found out about it when I applied for the liquor license. Um, it is a bit confusing here on, since there's so many different types. Uh, and then I realized that I could get a type 86, I believe it's called. Um, but I wanted to get through this process first. And we don't want to have you go through two processes. Uh, so that being rebuttal, no other questions of the applicant. The item is before us. Uh, I wanted just to make a motion that we approve the CUP. We make the findings necessary. We strike item 10. Um, do you, we include wine tasting in, along with alcohol sales and Glenn, can you craft the provision that would allow him, uh, that would make this primarily for na I get, uh, natural organic wines and. You wanted to do a lot or something. Uh, Madam Chair, can I suggest, or can we ask the applicant if he would also like beer tasting? I'm not a beer oh. drinker. I don't know if that's a thing, but. Oh, absolutely. I was thinking tasting, but I would assume you would like beer tasting as well as wine tasting. Sure. There's not as much because there aren't that many organic producers that I've found. I'm trying to keep the beer to be California beers. Um, but if I wasn't sure if that was included with the type 86 license or not, is type 86 just wine? Right. So, um, Madam Chair, we will craft that that uh, condition number PLN one to include uh, organic sales, uh, beer and wine, and then include wine, uh, wine and beer tastings and the license uh, that they would need to come back for. We um, the CUP will already have that included in it, uh, so it will go much faster for them. And I don't think we need separate language for singles. We allow that, don't we, in Palm Springs? We Unless do. it's prohibited. Right, we do, and we did not write in the conditions uh, prohibitation of single sales. So are there any other conditions that members of the commission would like to add? I, I, I would just like to add a comment, if I can. Sure, but can we get a uh, second on the motion before we get comments? Or I'd like to second it. Okay, uh, now Commissioner Irvin. Uh, yeah, I, I just um, kind of wanted to, to mention something. Um, in the northern part of town, um, we're still seeing cannabis, we're still seeing alcohol. We're still not seeing a grocery store. We're still not seeing anything of that nature. Um, I, I just wanted to, to mention that, you know, I know that it's 900 square feet, but here is another project that's in front of us. It's alcohol uh, or either cannabis. So I just wanted to make that comment um, and he has a great project, but I just wanted to make that comment that 
we're still seeing the same thing in the northern part of town, Palm Springs. Can I say something? Pardon? Um, Mr. Irvin, I agree with you 100%, especially regarding supermarkets. I live in the neighborhood just six and a half minutes away, and I'm actually right behind Stater Brothers is where I live. And just being in and out of the shop the past you know, several weeks, I wish there was more supermarkets in that area or something on the northern end, uh, because there really isn't much besides Albertsons and Stater Brothers, and there's nothing on the North Palm Canyon side. And if that were to come before the board, I would support that wholeheartedly. Uh, are there any other comments? Uh, can you call the roll on this? It's a second on this. Commissioner Maruzzi. Maruzzi. Chairwoman? Yes. Commissioner Maruzzi? Yes. Commissioner Layan? Yes. Commissioner Irvin? I, I would say yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Song? Yes. Vice Chair Roberts? Um, he recused himself because he... Got it. Motion is approved six with one recusal. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I'll see you after you open. I hope so. Thank you so much. Okay, moving along, our next item is uh, Palm Springs Country Club LLC for an amendment of the development agreement for Serena Park, a residential development consisting of 386 attached and detached residential units, open space, streets, and park space on 126 acres of land previously operated as a golf course located east of Sunrise, north of Verona Road, and southwest of the Whitewater River within sections 1 and 36. Um, before we have a staff report, uh, I wanted to make a comment. I had asked staff to send you a letter uh, that was sent by uh, the attorneys for Serena Park, uh, which claimed that I could not provide a fair hearing to the applicants on their request. The reason being um, that I visited the project site. Actually, I, I visited it three times, uh, once with um, City Councilor Grace Garner, once with J.R. Roberts, and the other day by myself. Um, and after one of the visits, um, I reported to code uh, what appeared to be nuisance conditions at the property. Let me be clear, um, I've worked on this project for five years. Uh, I was very enthusiastic about it five years ago, and I'm very prepared to keep an open mind about the project application and have not made any decision uh, one way or the other on how I will vote for the Planning Commission vote. This vote is, um, the decision on this is with the City Council, and I believe that our job is to provide the city council with as many facts uh, and recommendations to help them with their decision on this. Um, I did in fact uh, file a, a code complaint um, and I did that as a private citizen, not as a member of the commission. Commissioner Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Given the, the letter that you just referred to, I feel, and I too have been um, accused of, of perhaps being unbiased or the potential to be, I'm sorry, the potential to be biased on this project. Um, I too worked on this as a planning commissioner many years ago, and I also helped write 
the development agreement and voted for approval of this project on multiple occasions. So I, I don't think there's any real credible reason that I would be biased at this point. Um, but I felt the need to, to state that for the record as well. Thank you. Uh, can we have a staff report, please? Madam Chair and Planning Commissioners, the item before you, as you've indicated, is a request to amend the Serena Park Development Agreement. Uh, as you recall, the Serena Park project involves the redevelopment of the former Palm Springs Country Club Golf Course, as you see here on the screen, with 386 residential units, including both detached and attached single-family homes. There will also be internal streets, private open space, and a park that is available to the public. It is um, 386 units on 126 acres. Um, the entitlements back in 2016 involved amendments to the general plan, land use designation, a plan development district, a tentative track map to subdivide the property, and that was all approved back in September of 2016. Part of that approval, the project was conditioned to obtain a development agreement um, between the applicant and the city. And so that was um, carried out and approved in July of 2017, followed by a subsequent amendment related to the terms of the, um, the fee that is required under the development agreement that was amended back in 2018, October of 2018. So um, the request before you is uh, to revise the proposed, or the, I should say, the approved performance schedule, which was an attachment to the development agreement. Um, and I'll go through that in just a moment. A request to delay the payment of the $3 million development fee, um, development agreement fee from November 1st of this year to November 1st of next year. And um, the applicant has also requested to defer undergrounding um, utilities for the project um, until homes for each of the respective phases are developed. So those are the requests that the applicant has submitted uh, before you. In terms of the performance schedule, you can see here on the screen, this is the schedule that was uh, approved as a part of the uh, amended uh, development agreement. And uh, what you see on the left are the dates that were approved um, as a part of the development agreement. And then what's in red here in the middle are the requested date, requested modification dates for each of the various activities for the different phases of the project. So it's roughly a year and a half uh, delay in actually recording and improving uh, the phase one portion of the project. And that obviously continues for the rest of the phases, uh, as you see here on the screen with the different dates. Uh, so to give you a sense of the phasing, it does start at the southeast corner of the project site. So that is on Verona Road and Whitewater Club Drive what you see here in the purple on the, the screen. Uh, there's a phase one and then the fa phase 1A and phase 1B, phase 2A, 2B. The park, the public park space would be completed as a part of phase one. And then the rest of the phases carry forward to the northwest. So phases uh, three and four are shown in green and blue. This item was introduced to the Planning Commission on July 28th. And at that meeting, the commission had some requests before this item uh, returned. And so staff included some of this information in your report. Uh, specifically, we identified a number of um, the number of application submittals that the applicant has provided to either the city or uh, another responsible agency, such as Desert Water Agency. So there, there is a list in the report of the applications that have been submitted, plan checks, and fees that have been paid. 
We also provided as a part of an attachment to your report, the uh, annual reviews of the development agreement that the applicant has provided to staff in terms of their progress on the project and then our review of that progress. Uh, the commission also asked for the history of property conditions and code compliance issues. Staff um, just noted in the report that we have regularly been on the property to address code compliance issues. Uh, subsequent to the report being published, we were able to obtain the history of three years of code compliance issues with the property. So that was forwarded to the planning commission as well. And then lastly, the planning commission asked for some additional background and potential options for creating a third access point to the project. Uh, as you might recall, or for those who might not have been part of the project um, five years ago, when the project was reviewed by the Planning Commission, the Commission did recommend that the third access point be um, made part of the project in 2016. The Council, when they reviewed it, ultimately um, approved the project with the two primary access points and deferred potential third access point to staff. And, uh, that has been uh, has remained a emergency um, vehicle option um, for the project. So there is there are still two primary access points for the project. In terms of the process, this is an amendment to the development agreement in our zoning code, Chapter ninety four point oh eight. The zoning code does require that any amendment, either in whole or part, to a development agreement, does require that the process it require plan commission review at a hearing as well as city council review. Uh, so that's why the application is before you today uh, because they are proposing changes to the terms of the agreement. So your recommendation tonight uh, would be to the city council and the city council would also hold a public hearing at a future meeting. There are five findings that we've identified in your report uh, that are required to be made as a part of um, your review and recommendation to the city council. And in terms of uh, staff's recommendation, um, based on the information uh, we provided to you in the report, we are recommending approval of the requests to amend the development agreement uh, and allow modification of the performance schedule as identified um, in the table earlier in an earlier slide, delaying payment of the development agreement for one year until November 1st of next year, um, the applicant has uh, been working with a home builder to um, commence construction of the project. Um, I believe that home builder is on the, the meeting this evening and would be able to uh, introduce themselves and provide information on, on their background. Um, so based on um, that and that the fact that the project would still be carried forward, even though it is delayed for a year or year and a half, um, and given the um, uncertainties that have surrounded the pandemic, albeit the housing market has improved, this uh, staff has recommended approval of these changes. And then finally, uh, the developer's requests um, regarding the undergrounding of utilities. Staff believes that this would be more appropriate to do in two phases. So the first phase would have to be completed prior to the occupancy of the phase one homes. And then all remaining um, utilities that are above ground work would be required to be completed prior to occupancy permits for the phase three B homes. So instead of doing it for each phase, our recommendation, because it is such a large undertaking to complete undergrounding of utilities, uh, it would be more appropriate to do in two phases, do um, majority of it in the first phase with the any remaining portion as, as a second phase. The plan to underground would have to be reviewed by the city engineer for approval um, to ensure that it does meet our requirements as well as the utility company requirements. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation and um, this is a public hearing and um, I'm happy to answer any questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there questions of staff? Uh, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Maruzzi, Commissioner Hirschbein, and then Commissioner Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to understand from staff, 
I mean, I've read the, the criteria and, and the findings as staff has found them, but I, the arguments don't seem particularly strong as to why you have these recommendations. In a year and a half, it seems to be a substantial amount of time to me to extend this. And postponing the payment of the, um, of the fee, it's not clear that that's really been argued very comprehensively in, in this in these findings. So I'm trying to better understand why staff is recommending approval. So the, um, again, I think the intent is that the, the fee would still be collected. The city would still receive the benefit of the $3 million as opposed to uh, in the event that the developer is unable to carry forward the development agreement and, and ultimately we um, uh, terminate the agreement, the alternative is the city gets zero dollars and we still have to deal with the property and the maintenance conditions that, that uh, have continually been problematic for that property. Um, so that, that really carries out the, the, the nuisance longer. Um, and so those are really kind of the, um, the basic um, reasonings for why we we're suggesting that a, a one year delay is, is better than a potentially five or 10 year delay. Um, because then we would have to potentially go through additional um, uh, reviews, additional hearings to um, bring, the pro bring another project forward at a later time. What is the typical time frame when these development fees are, are paid? So the so the the development agreement fee that's the three million dollars is over and above other typical development fees that are being paid to the city or other outside agencies. So this is a unique situation um, that is not typically required for other development projects. Do you recall why in this is this is a unique case? Because the property as a part of the land use approvals did not have development rights when it was originally approved. It was open space designation by the city. And the intention was that the fee would be paid to the city in order to um, acquire open space elsewhere. And did that happen? Oh, actually, obviously not, since the fee hasn't been paid. Okay, I think that's it for now. Thank you. Before we go on, just on that, this fee was due at the time the development agreement was to be signed. Isn't that correct? So the way the the, um, the agreement is laid out is it says that it's a pro rate of payment for each home that is built. So there is a no, 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 David. Originally, it was to be paid at the time the agreement was signed. The developer refused to do that, and it went to city council for a special hearing, which is why I think it says it's an item of default if it's not paid. Am I correct? There, uh, so the amendment that happened in 2018 was to change the language that was within that um, section of the development agreement. So it was really related to the fact that there was language in there that said it would result in the default of a note on the property. And evidently that was problematic for financing reasons um, for the developer and um, obtaining financing to develop the project. So it was changed to just basically say that uh, if you do not make the payment, you're in default of the agreement and potentially losing rights um, granted for development. As opposed, to, as opposed to default um, and potential um, um, default and potential acquisition of the property. I think I'm, and I'll let maybe the applicant attorney to clarify. Maybe our attorney could clarify. Yeah, because I'd like to follow up on that. Well, that was my question also. Uh, what, so originally the $3 million was supposed to be earmarked for acquisition of open space outside the development. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And then originally the development agreement was signed with the applicant agreeing to pay the $3 million upon signing, is that correct? 
I don't remember precisely what the original agreement said. Uh, perhaps staff would be able to explain that one. And maybe perhaps Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Roberts could explain that too. So, um, well, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't remember the exact date, but we offered the owner of this property a great opportunity to pay that as part of the performance schedule. If um, staff were to look at the performance schedule, I believe there's a date in there that that money was due. And, and I think it, it's coming up soon. I think it's November of this year, which is why they are requested. And, and that was a, a special allowance we made to them. And for Commissioner Maruzzi, yes, this was a definite trade deal for open space to open space. So by, as you well know, golf courses are considered open space. And because we were allowing the development of, a, of an existing golf course, uh, this was the, these fees were so that the city could acquire space in other places. The city has acquired quite a bit of open space subsequently. And um, the city has done that at its own cost and with the help of Sierra Club and other dollars. But the acquisition, uh, the, the goal is that once the city got this $3 million, it could acquire a lot more open space and land. The timing couldn't be better given the other issues of, of golf courses and things that we've already been looking at. And the city could very much use these dollars for acquisition. But to specifically answer the last question, the three hundred dollars, the three million dollars is due this November. Okay, okay. Madam Chair, to add to that, it's in Section four point zero three of the development agreement, and the date is November first, twenty twenty one. The applicant is requesting to extend that payment date one year. And that's correct. That it's an item of default if it's not paid. Correct. It is a potential item of default if it is not paid. That is correct. Could we, uh, could, would, would the commission be within its rights to recommend to council that a portion of that fee be due November 21st with the remainder of it due in, in a year from that date? Uh, yeah, Mr. Hirschman, members of the commission, um, any of these terms in the context of an amendment to the development agreement can be altered or renegotiated by the city in exchange for an extension. If the commission has particular recommendations it would like to suggest to the council in those negotiations, it's free to do so. Because my, my concern is that the developer has very little skin in the game at this point. And if we sort of up the ante a little bit, and, and require some portion of that uh, fee to be paid by the, the due date as it's now written, uh, it, I think it commits him in a more meaningful way to the project. Commissioner Hirschbein, uh, it, that's a good point. I think we want to take that up in our deliberations. I'm and sorry. I'll make sure, I, that I, we, I'll make sure we get there. I know, it's not a question, I get it. Yeah, it's not a question of staff. Yeah. Uh, um, can I ask? A, I do have another question, though. Is that okay? Yes, of course. Um, I don't remember the. I think I called on you next, and then, yes. So, David, if you could just quickly summarize the five findings that you've been able to make to uh, make the uh, so that we would recommend approval to council. Can you just? Quickly summarize those five findings. Possibly the our city attorney can do that. Yeah, you can. Well, I can certainly uh, explain what the findings are. I would defer to staff as to the underlying basis for those findings. Um, but the finding one is that the development agreement is consistent with the objectives, policies, land uses, programs, and the general plan, and. Uh, the report indicates that uh, there will not be any inconsistencies or uh, inconsistency or problems with the objectives, policies, and the general plan. Um, 
the second finding is it must be compatible with the use of authorized in and the regulations for the land use district where the property is located. Um, the land uses will not be affected by the proposed amendment. This is really about money and timing of development at deadlines as opposed to changes of use. Um, the third finding, the development agreement is in conformity with public convenience, general welfare, good land use practice. Uh, the finding written in there is that it remains consistent with the previously approved entitlements, which were found originally to be uh, in cons are consistent with the public convenience, general welfare, and there's really no change to the underlying uses. Of course, the Planning Commission you know, can look at these findings and come to a contrary conclusion. Uh, the fourth finding is that the development agreement will not be detrimental to the health, safety, and general welfare. Uh, the finding as written indicates that uh, the project benefits of the development agreement will still occur. It would just be delayed by the amount of extension provided in the amendment. Um, and there would uh, you know, just be that delay in the project, but the finding is that that delay in and of itself would not be detrimental to health, safety, general welfare. Uh, the fifth finding is that the development agreement will not adversely affect orderly development of property or the preservation of property values. Uh, again, the finding is written to basically say there only affects the timing of the development and in financial matters, it does not affect the actual substance of the project such that it would affect orderly development of the property. That's how it's written in the staff report and in the resolution. If you'd like to ask staff further about the basis for some of these findings, um, you're free to do so. I, I just like to ask a follow up question on that. In terms of it not being detrimental to the general welfare or detriment, in terms of it, it being the extension of time, not being detrimental to the general welfare or detrimental to adjacent property values. If we get uh, a whole slew of uh, emails from adjacent property owners saying that the delay has been detrimental. Can we take that into account when we make this finding? Uh, you can take those facts on the record into account in uh, making a decision on these findings, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Olanian and then Commissioner Roberts. Uh, thank you, Chair. I want to look at the code compliance or code enforcement issues for a minute um, and ask staff some questions. I'm, as I read through the novel um, of detailed reports and ongoing attempts by the city code enforcement people to get some sort of compliance, um, it, I, I'm struck by what seems to be a spectacular lack of responsiveness by the developer. Um, it's as if they are not of their own initiative maintaining the property or even doing um, any kind of routine inspection of the property to see the issues and they wait and it appears that they're not really doing anything until they get a call from the city. That being said, I don't know if that's the case, and I don't know if staff has reason to believe that the developer is actually out there doing the best that they can, or if this is just what happens with all um, vacant properties, or is it as bad as it seems. So I'm kind of looking for some sort of um, input from staff as to how would you rate this relative to other properties. Um, and then have the, the follow-up question would be, has staff looked at or considered at all um, any kind of health and safety receivership or any other kind of mechanism that, that could perhaps get uh, greater compliance? Um, I would say that you are correct. This has been a continual issue, code enforcement with this property, code complaints with this property. Um, it's not unusual though, when you have a property with an, um, an absent owner or an owner that doesn't you know, live nearby or on the site, um, other vacant properties or properties that are undeveloped have, um, you know, have similar issues where dumping occurs. Um, and we've, I've been in direct contact with uh, neighbors of the, the project who have, um, also had expressed concern with, 
trespassing and um, other issues. So it's not um, an uncommon thing that we've uh, that we've seen generally in the city, but uh, especially with this property. So uh, it has been a continual problem um, for the city and code enforcement. We have met on site with the developer on um, occasion and uh, looked at ways to um, you know, remove uh, some of the things that have been left on the property and improve uh, conditions so that there are no hazards in terms of uh, fire or otherwise. Um, so uh, again, it, it really becomes a continual um, issue for this property. If there are other questions on this topic, uh, once Commissioner Lanyon is through, people can raise those so that we just ask all those questions at one one time of staff. Uh, thank you. Uh, the other thing that I'm wondering is, uh, does staff have any reason to believe that granting more time is going to improve um, in any way the maintenance of property? I don't think that additional time would allow the developer to make greater improvements besides just allowing them to move forward and actually have a presence on the site at some point here in the next year, year and a half. Are there other questions about property maintenance? Commissioner Irvin, Commissioner Roberts. Um, so staff, it, it, is staff saying that um, the, the property, if we were to approve the property, um, we wouldn't be able to get the three million dollars. Um, that is—is is that what you're saying? If we approve the amendment, yeah. If we approve the amendment, there's a possibility that we'll be able to get the three million. And if we deny it, wh what what is will we still be able to get the three million dollars? If the city denies the requested amendment, then the three million dollars is due in two months and the, the developer would have to make that payment in two months um if they don't pay it it becomes um in default and it becomes uh, uh an issue for non-compliance with the the agreement okay commissioner roberts and i, I wanted to direct these questions just to the condition of the property Commissioner Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think my questions were asked and answered, or we're, I know we're going to give the um, owner an opportunity to respond to the defaults on enforcement in the past. I specifically wanted to know if the owner had been um, asked to actually seal the property. Um, when I went and saw the property, the gates to the property were wide open. In fact, I, I can't recall, but I think the gates were even not even attached any longer. They were on the ground. And it is my understanding is that, is that there are multiple other openings to the property. And I wondered if uh, uh, the city had requested um, or tried to enforce on sealing the property. And if that was the case, um, uh, why the uh, owner had not done that. The, I, I just wanted to add something. The code complaint that I made was in part that you could drive three trucks into the property. It was so wide open. I went back a month later, two days ago, and the front area was still open. One of the side street areas was completely open. And I noticed uh, from the street, not going in, three or four other areas where you could walk in, ride bicycles in, or uh, motorcycles. So- Madam Chair, are these questions only relating right now to enforcement? I have a question about the- no, I just, uh, Before you go there, I think Commissioner Alanian asked staff if they had any way, and you asked if they'd asked to seal the property, the question is, does staff have any way of sealing the property? Uh, 
Um, they have had uh, fences up in the past, but you are correct. So it seems as though those fences have been continually taken down. Um, so it has been problematic um, for preventing trespassing. Have they been asked to put a better fence up on the property? They've been could, asked to make okay, repairs, okay. but I'm not sure the extent of uh, those conversations because those have typically been with our code enforcement office. So that isn't within your purview. That's a question. Correct. Thank you. Commissioner Roberts, you had other questions. We're no longer on the condition of the property. Thank God. Um, so um, my question is to staff, and I first want to apologize in advance to staff. I should have sent this question earlier and I had made a note to do so, and then I didn't. So um, you may not have this information on hand and I and I, I needed to clarify it. As, if you don't, it's because I didn't ask and give you time to gather the information. But with respect to the performance schedule on this project, you gave us a list of what the original performance schedule um, was meant to be. Or, or the original agreement um, to the performance schedule. And then you gave us um, a list of requested extensions to the performance schedule. My specific question has to do with whether the owner or applicant has met the performance schedule up to this point. And if not, what areas of the performance schedule have they not met? Correct, yeah, so they have not met um, dates um, through um, as recent as September of 2020, they were required to um, begin construction for infrastructure on phase two. So uh, I'm sorry, so was there a performance schedule element that was missed to begin infrastructure for phase one? Yes. So that's what I'm asking. It would be helpful to know, I think for myself and my co colleagues, where they are in this process really, and, and how, what areas of their performance schedule have they missed? If you could even just verbally um, walk through some of that, I think it would help us in our deliberations. Sure. So uh, back, uh, let's see, I can, it's probably easier if I just show it to you on the screen. Um, that would be helpful. Thank you. And if you already gave it to us, forgive me. So you can see on the right, these are the activities that were supposed to occur. We are obviously currently in September of 2021. So you can see here that October of 2021, next month, they were to have recorded phase three map. They have um, so David, may I interrupt you? So any, everything in the activity. They've, uh, they've started, they have done engineering. I can tell you that they've submitted plans, but they, those plans have not been approved for the phase one. Has financing of phase one occurred or any proof of financing? They've indicated they've given information to staff that they've been working on that, but there's no, um, there's nothing to substantiate that, that we have. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no problem. Um, so in terms of the phase one map, uh, they have submitted a smaller portion of the phase one map for plan check. However, that they have not um, processed that plan check or recorded the first phase map, which was due to occur October of 2019. Moving beyond that, phase two map, obviously they haven't even started, as far as I know, um, plans for um, re, um, for the phase two map. They have not, um, the improvement plan approval has not occurred. So that's why they're requesting to postpone that from October of 19 to March of next year. Infrastructure construction phase one, uh, so that is really the, the underground um, uh, undergrounding and installation of utilities, streets. Um, that was due to occur June of last year. 
and they're requesting a postponement to March of next year. This has not been submitted as far as I know. Um, the infrastructure for phase two has not been submitted. The first house has not been built and not closed, um, which would have do, been due to occur March of this year. So that is being post requested to be postponed to December of 22. Uh, so basically, yeah, everything below what you see here from March, October of 19 has been requested to be extended because none of it has been executed. Other, uh, Commissioner Roberts, if you have more questions or questions on this topic. Uh, that's all I have for right now. I just wanted to get a fuller picture of where we are in this project. And I didn't understand in, when I saw that document the first time that the developer had not met most of the performance schedule on this. So uh, I think that answers many questions for me. Thank you. Uh, just in on that, have they met any of the performance schedule? The, this, this, uh, development was none of the housing models were approved have they provided drawings gotten approvals for phase one housing submitted the final development plan for the first phase which was only a portion of phase 1a but that was turned down right they did not proceed with it because they said the aac uh, required revisions and as a as a declarant, wouldn't they have worked on the streets and provided lots for builders? Has anything gone in that direction? They've submitted the first phase um, plan check improvements for streets, but um, it only went through one plan check, as I if if I recall correctly, and they have not responded to the first set of plan check comments. When were those comments issued? Uh, I stand corrected. They, well, they responded to comments from Desert Water Agency back in February of 20. And then they submitted plan check uh, for the final map in December of 19, paid fees in January of 20 for plan check. And is that for street improvements? So they have for streets and lots and gutters and things like that. Yeah, they've submitted plan check for off-site streets for Golden Sands, Verona Road. Um, and they've responded to the comments last time it was responded to was March of 20. And they've submitted on-site storm drain improvement plans, as well as a, a response to the first plan check comments in March of 20. On-site street improvement plans, they responded to the first plan check comments in March of 20. And that was the last the last item that they submitted to engineering. Uh, Commissioner Maruzzi had questions, and I, I will have questions as to whether they can get to March to where they want to be by March of 2020, 2022, which is only a few months away. So, so going back to <clears throat> Vice Chair Roberts' question, so what you just told us, does that mean that some of these have uh, occurred, but not all, or, and I'm still a little confused. So we're, say April 2019, start engineering, has that occurred? So they did start engineering. Um, they did, as I mentioned, the improvement plans, they don't have approval. They went through plan check. That was due to occur in October of 19. 
And so while they had plan, they had submitted plans for plan check, they did not receive approval and finalize the plan check process. So what do these dates actually mean in terms of the development agreement? Are there penalties associated with not meeting certain dates? Or I mean, how is it that it's two years later after October 2019, they're asking for uh, you know an extension to 2022 is a simple question, I think. Yeah, so the, the developers indicated that uh, you know, in their in our annual reviews of the project, that um, there have been delays. So I probably defer to them as to the specifics as to why they haven't. Ex- no, no, I guess I guess the question isn't why, but isn't there some specific um, event that occurs if dates aren't met? I mean, is there are there any ramifications to not meeting these, short of coming back and asking for a time extension? During the annual review, the city could schedule a hearing to either modify or terminate the agreement. Okay, so it's up to staff to to do this, to negotiate this, or um, okay, and that did not occur. This staff felt that were comfortable with moving these dates along up to this point. Staff had requested information on why the project had not moved forward and in, during the annual review last October accepted their concern of with the pandemic. I see. All right. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Song, are you on the same topic? Um, similar, yes. Uh, and the okay. question is, David, are you aware if the underground um, of the utility line plans have been submitted to the utility companies and in process. Uh, I, I know they're not part of the city, but are you aware if the applicant has submitted those plans for underground, even though they're asking if they can face it? The information that I have from the applicant doesn't indicate that they have, but if I'm incorrect, I'll, I'll let them let, me, let us know. Okay, and then uh, Madam Chair, um, when the topic of the third axis or entryway to the project. We'll come to that next. I just want to finish questions on this. Uh, This is one I've talked with staff about, but this project had a condition that required the applicant to come in for approval of the houses as well, and none of that was approved in the original. They're they're not entitled for their houses yet uh, for phase one, two, three, or four. Um, They process wise, they have to go through um, uh, architectural review and planning commission on this since it's a PD. Uh, How long would it take once they got plans for that to go through those two processes? On average, that process probably takes three to four months on average. Could be more, could be less. And that includes design because no designs have been submitted yet, correct? They did submit plans um, that were basically rejected by the AAC. But nothing recent has been submitted, and that was last year. So they don't have plans. They have a rejected set of plans. And and were those plans uh, for full phase one development? A portion of phase one. Uh, how many houses were submitted? For how many designs? For how many homes, I should say? It was for 17 homes just 17 homes in phase one. And how many homes is phase one projected to have? So the phasing plan had, um, I may have to pull that up. We are are hitting you with a lot right now. I'll have to pull it up if you just give me one second. The, The reason I'm asking is, it doesn't seem that it was a real submittal or full submittal. Maybe those were just for the model homes or something. 
and and we never saw the we never saw that. So I guess because AAC denied it, it never came back to us. So you're saying they gave us they they gave staff seventeen homes to look at. It was sent to AAC. AAC denied it, and they never came back. Correct. That's correct. So phase 1A uh, is 49 homes. 49. So they submitted 17 of 49 homes. Yeah, and phase 1B uh, would be another 30. I guess the total phase 1A and 1B is 80. Okay, so that would be another deadline missed in their performance schedule. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And do you have indication that they have designs for homes to submit at this point? I'm sorry, what was your question? Do you have indication that they're, they have designs for the homes to submit? We have not seen any um, plans at this time for um, from the new builder, so uh, no. And do we have, or has, have they, have they worked with planning commission and AAC on design guidelines? Uh, no, that has not been done. So yet. those would also need to be developed for the phases. Uh, so that, could, yeah, that could be developed. Correct. Cause there were none that were adopted when the project um, was approved. It just typically, cause this was approved in 17, wouldn't we typically see with a master developer that they would be putting roads in and doing that kind of work in advance uh, where they're merchant, where they're, we're bringing in merchant builders. Correct. And so we haven't seen any activity on that regard either, other than they've submitted some plans and haven't responded to comments. Correct. Okay. Uh, going to the next point, um, which is uh, uh, Commissioner Song wanted to talk about the third entrance, and there's a question for the attorney on that as to whether there's anything we can do on that. Um, Planning Commission, I recall, recommended a third uh, a third access point, which council didn't take up. Question for you, Jim, could the city have gone in or could the city go in for eminent domain on the one entrance way off of Farrell such that that, that could be used for the entire complex? Oh, uh, That's most, uh. most logical. <laughs> It's the most logical entry, and I believe it's been denied by the five or ten condo associations that are in that area. Right, uh, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I, I got to be honest with you. I, I don't know if that would be suitable as a public purpose for eminent domain. That's something that you know I, I can discuss with my colleagues. I can bring that back to the commission at a later date. Um, I've, in my experience, not seen or heard of eminent domain for an entryway to a private development. So that's something we'd have to look at a little bit more closely. I know. I've, I've just been thinking about that <laughs> now five years later that I should have asked that question five years ago. Um, the... The other, is it in our purview with these changes? There is the access point that's only a exit. Is it in our purview to open that up as a uh, entrance? It is what I could, the best I could say on this is that the planning commission could make that recommendation to the city council and perhaps that could be included within the negotiations. Um, that gets a little tricky because now we're altering the design of the project, right. but I think it could be theoretically possible to work that kind of a change as a condition of granting the extension. We'd have to look at that a little bit further too. 
Uh, Commissioner Song, you had more questions on this? Um, yeah, the, the, the question was really, um, if the if the agreement had gone through at this point, we would have been uh, seeing the first phase homes being constructed and the current design would have been uh, under construction. But now that we are two years out and um, the fabric of Palm Springs has changed um, both in traffic and um, and also uh, having citizens living in Palm Springs and how BI Square is used. And so therefore my question is, because the project has not been built and because the project is exhausting resources of the city, can the project be looked at again with the current conditions and perhaps ask for a revived traffic study of what the uh, sources are through this neighborhood from the Freeway 10 exit on Gene Autry, on Racket Club, and then this neighborhood um, due to COVID and many other reasons so that it can justify or recommend by a traffic engineer that a third connection is really highly recommended. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, members of the commission, I, I would advise the commission to be cautious in its approach here. Uh, we are talking about an amendment to dates, an amendment to deadlines for payment. You know, I had mentioned that theoretically it may be possible to, you know, look at the third entry exit way, again, theoretically. Um, the challenge is how far do we go down before we start looking at a complete reopener of the project? And I would remind the commission that this was approved. We do have a valid development agreement in place currently. Um, there are questions about um, some of the items being defaulted, but at the present time, uh, there has not been a hearing scheduled before the city council uh, to consider termination or amendment of the agreement. So those entitlements are still subject to the agreement and contracted for right now. So, you know, again, we can look at changing the dates, possibly changing the uh, deadline of the fee. You know, again, I, we may be able to look at the dry, the entryway possibly as part of the negotiations, uh, but I would caution against treating this like a reopener of the project. A piece of history here, uh, the exit only area was not treated as a third entry because the neighborhood around it was vehemently opposed to there being an entry at that location. So the, the reason we don't have a third entry wasn't that we didn't entertain it. It's that in one instance, the condo areas wouldn't, were not willing to let their entry area be utilized and the neighbors around the exit area were not willing to let that be utilized. One question for Flynn on, I know that city council changed the staging on the roads so that the, is the roadway to be built all at once so that you can enter and exit the development from both sites or, uh, cause I thought that I remember that being an issue for city council. Will we actually have two, two, an en two entry points or two exit points? Um, there were conditions relative to the phasing of construction and I'd ask Mr. Newell if he could respond to that question. Yeah, correct, uh, Madam Chair. There was a requirement that they provide a roadway from the entry from San Rafael to allow construction to funnel through that location as opposed to the neighborhood uh, at the southeast corner. And what about the entrance from um, from Sunrise on Golden Sands Road? Was that to be opened up at the same time? Yeah, that's what I was referring to. So that entry from San Rafael and Sunrise is the the second or the other entry point for the project. And so there was a requirement that that be the primary entry point for construction. And that's to be opened up now so that they should be building those roads as a part of phase one. 
Uh, I'd have to look at the specifics, but I don't know if it was a construction road and it would be a um, not the fully improved road um, at the con- initial stage for phase one, or if it was the actual full improvement, including all undergrounding of utilities that would be necessary. So that's something that I would have to probably look and, up. And we'd have to look at that when we look at the phasing of the undergrounding of utilities, depending on what requirements there were for that roadway, correct? Yeah, so that might be another issue uh, because, um, you know, the the utilities span areas outside of the roadway that would be required. So um, the time frame at which that would occur um, might be different um, than the actual full improvement of that road. That's why I'm not sure if the, the roadway that goes from the northwest corner to the southeast corner, if it was actually the fully improved road or not. But they haven't asked us to eliminate the requirement that they enter through Sunrise and San Rafael. Correct. So they're obviously anticipating building that road. Correct. Uh, the last questions I think with this have to do with the undergrounding of the utilities. Um, and perhaps you could explain to um, the commission what you explained to me as to what would be required to have this broken into two phases. Sure. Um, But before I go into that, I did find the condition. It says um, related to construction requirements and phasing that the central spine road, it shall be developed as a temporary construction road from Golden Sands Drive to Whitewater Club Drive. It shall be developed in phase one of the construction phasing. And that there were two, um, yeah. So they were proposing a temporary construction road uh, as part of the first phase that would carry construction traffic from San Rafael and Sunrise and Golden Sands. Uh, but to respond to your question, uh, in terms of the staff recommendation for the undergrounding of utilities, um, in con- consultation with our um, engineering division, uh, we believe that uh, as opposed to undergrounding the all above current existing above ground utilities, which can be a quite um, involved and lengthy process when it comes to getting approval from um, private property owners that would be impacted and undergrounding the connections to the above ground utilities to individual homes. It would probably make more sense to have it as a two phase, um, uh, a two phase underground project, the first phase um, being done as a part of phase one, and then the second phase being done as a part of phase three B, that would probably more um, line up with the, um, you know, because it is a large undertaking, at least we know that a, a good amount of it would be done as a part of the first phase. And then those that would remain would be done um, kind of in the middle of the project in phase three. Can you, can you explain what, why they want it? and what you explained about who has to approve it and what a phasing plan is and what the timelines on on those are. Yeah, I I might ask Mr. Menares if he um, has uh, additional background that he can provide because he does typically work with that more than for me. Hello, everybody. Uh, Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, if you can explain what would be involved in getting approvals for a phasing plan, what's involved in a phasing plan, and why actually the applicant is requesting it. I think it's important people for people to know why they need it. Okay. Um, the phasing plan that we're, that we're most um, interested in would be for the overhead, existing overhead utilities. That becomes... Um, if anybody's seen an existing neighborhood where you have a new developer coming in and taking out overhead utilities and putting them underground becomes very cumbersome. It becomes um, very 
logistic wise, it's really tough because you're, you're having to, um, like David mentioned, um, impact existing homes. You're having to dig up their yards. You're having to dig up their um, pool decks and that sort of thing. So that a lot of that stuff takes a long time to do um, and rather hold up um, their construction or delay them because we're trying to make them do all of that undergrounding in one phase. I, we think it's more appropriate to have it split up into two phases that will allow them to um, keep working. And then as they're building phase one and two, they can be working on those agreements and that um, plan checking with those utility companies, um, particularly Southern California Edison, um, Frontier and whoever else might be sharing those poles. Um, as it relates to phasing of the rest of the underground, that's new construction, um, that's typically done with the construction phasing of the houses. Um, phase one, they would just do all of the underground that's new because there isn't anything to coordinate. That's new plans, that's new construction. There's really no reason not to do that. Um, and that's that's where we kind of came up with the idea of allowing existing overhead to be phased um, to try to allow that train to keep moving. How many homes are involved in the needing agreements and digging up backyards? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Maybe um, the developer has those numbers, but it's uh, there's there's quite a few along. Uh, I don't recall what the name of the street is going north and south. Is it Whitewater Club Drive? And how long would it take to get a phasing agreement approved by Southern California Edison? Um, again, I would have to allow them to kind of speak to that. I don't know where they are with that, but when we generally see um, new developments um, before the development has um, been approved by, by the city, they've typically already been in talks with Edison to try to get a general idea of costs and um, what those requirements are going to be from them because those are some pretty long lead items. So um, I would hope that they had already had those discussions, but I, I, we're, we're not aware of it. Okay, so that's a question we need to ask the developers. Uh, the last, does anybody else have more questions on the phasing? Uh, the last question I have is, has the city in the talks with the prospective home builder, have you verified that they have an agreement with the developer to build the homes? And have you seen the agreement? Staff has not seen the agreement. We've only talked to the, uh, the, the potential home builder, but uh, the applicant can provide information on that. Okay, are there more questions of staff before we open the public hearing? I don't see any hands raised. Oh, Commissioner Song. Commissioner uh, Song. Yes. Um, um, Chairwoman, can you could you clarify something? Is the home developer to provide the design guidelines for architecture and have that approved before the architecture of the homes, the 17 homes are being reviewed? Or without the guidelines, the, the design has been uh, submitted and AAC has turned them down? There were no design guidelines, so AAC reviewed it and turned them down. Um, AAC at the time, I think you got the minutes, but there were no design guidelines. So in discussions with staff, uh, it when I talked with uh, David and Flynn about it, we would probably have to develop design guidelines at the same time we were reviewing the designs for the first 80 homes. So therefore the question is when those home designs were reviewed by AAC, was there a home builder selected? I under, my understanding is no, is that correct? Correct. Okay. So there's a, there's, so the design has been submitted without a home builder 
Oh, I, I guess the home builder can follow the design if the design was approved, correct? The um, the owner was um, looking to do it internally, um, and that's why they were doing a smaller phase as opposed to doing it for a home builder or having a home builder do the first phase. And have they changed that plan now, or is that still the plan? That's our understanding is that's their, they're changing the plan now to have an actual home builder do the first phase. Um, okay, at this point, uh, any other questions, Commissioner Lanian? Uh, thank you. I have a quick question for Mr. Medaris. Um, I know that the undergrounding issue is always fraught with uh, issues and is quite lengthy. To your knowledge, um, has either somebody on staff or somebody from the developer actually met with Edison? And do we have reason to believe that Edison thinks that the two phase plan um, is realistic? I do not know. Uh, we would need okay. to ask the developer that. We typically do not get involved with Edison um, unless Edison wants us to be involved. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is that, are there any other questions? Uh, at this point, I can. Op I would like to open the public hearing. The applicant has ten minutes the, uh, to present. The uh, public has three minutes. The applicant will then have three minutes in rebuttal, and we would ask that they stay uh, with us so that we can ask them questions after the rebuttal period. Do we have an applicant? Yes, Eric Taylor is, uh, is the applicant. Commissioner Warnick, can you hear me? Am I on? Yes, you are. This is Eric Taylor from the Serena Park project, and I'm one of the one of the owners. And I'm not sure if I can do my presentation and answer all of the questions that just came up within the 10 minutes. So I will start with my presentation and I will try to do my best to try to get through the questions that came up through the commission. So what I'd like to start with today is why are we here? What are we doing? Why, what, is the, what is the purpose that we have, the application that's in front of you today? And then I'd like to go through after that, I'd like to go through a little chronology from our standpoint on what we've done and in what time frame we've done it and what we're trying to do. And then after that, uh, I'd like to get into some of the little into the weeds on the on the dry utilities and what that means and how it's affected. Um, there are about 45 units in Desert Park Estates that are affected. And I'd like to kind of explain exactly what the construction process is and what the status quo is and why we're doing what we're doing and how that's affected by the conditions. So um, we do have Williams Homes in attendance on this meeting. We have their division president, Dan Farina. We have Kyle Milano, who's their vice president of land acquisition. And we have Rick Coop, who is their land acquisition manager as the builder, and they are present on this Zoom meeting. So um, they will be present and you can ask them questions also. Um, in January of this year, Williams was identified by us and we worked with Williams to say, this is the builder we wanna go forward with on this project. At that time, I had discussions with several members of the city, none of you on the commission, but a couple of council members with Flynn, with David, and with uh, the city manager's office that indeed we had a builder that we wanted to go forward with, that this looked good. And this was our general time frame that we wanted to work within with the goal of trying to get the $3 million paid by November 1st, 2021 of this year. And these were the things that we needed to do. So Williams does a process of due diligence to go look at the project. And their due diligence came in in late April 
of this year by the time we finalize an agreement with them. And yes, we do have a signed purchase and sale agreement. It is not a letter of intent. It is a signed legal agreement. Williams is in control of this property today. And no, that's that's a private contract between us and Williams and the city hasn't seen it, but does it exist? Absolutely. And they are there and you can ask them questions about how serious they are about going forward with this project. During their due diligence, Williams came up with three items that they wanted addressed by the city. And those are the three items in front of you tonight. And those three items were presented to the planning department at that time, last spring. The planning department then went and took those three items to the city attorney's office saying, how do we handle this? Do we handle it as a development agreement amendment? Do we handle it ourselves? Flynn has the ability under city statutes to make a determination relative to the interpretation of a condition. We're not asking to change that condition on the undergrounding of utilities. And I'll get into the the weeds, as I said later on in my presentation, about exactly what that is. So you really understand it, because I think that's important for all of you there today. Um, and they asked for an extension. Williams asked for an extension of the payment of the development agreement fee and put their schedule. They went through with their staff and said, what can we do? What is our what is our ability to perform on this project as we understand it? And that was presented to planning. Planning went and asked us to make an application, which we did and we paid fees for. And that resulted in the July 28th hearing that you had previously. Just prior to that hearing, we learned that it was gonna be a discussion item. And unfortunately, a lot of the questions like you had tonight and a lot of the comments that were made at that hearing, for whatever reason, you know, it is what it is, we were not allowed rebuttal or the ability to provide our comments at that time. So we appreciate being here tonight so we can talk about that, answer a lot of your questions, and hopefully come to a greater understanding of where the project is today and what's going on with this. What are we trying to do? So I'm gonna kind of step back for a second and paint a larger picture of what's going on at Serena Park. We have an undisputable situation due to the circumstance and the location of this property with trespass, vandalism, graffiti, dumping, tearing down of fences, homelessness, all kinds of problems. And they have been with this project before we owned it. I know that several of you, Kathy, Mr. Roberts, uh, Commissioner Hirschbein, have heard me talk about this before in the history of this project. I've been involved with this property for 30 years now, something like that, on dealing with it. Dealt, I spent extensive time with the previous owner. They had even greater problems than we did. They had a building they had to tear down because it was used for kids playing around at night. It's like the Dutch boy sticking his finger in the dike trying to stop the water coming out. Um, the solution that we have proposed to the city to solving the problem is to build houses, to create a development that we worked years on with you, with three of you on the commission today, to try and with the staff. David's been with this since day one. He knows intimately how this thing works in order to solve the problem, because that will solve the problem for the city and for the residents that surround us. Back in 2011, 2012, when I met with the city to say, I'm considering buying this property. What does this mean to the city of Palm Springs? Before we bought it, before we put money down, we went to them and the answer we got was work with the neighbors. And that's what we did. And I think you're all aware of that, of the effort and the level of effort that we did with the neighbors and said, what do you want? So when it comes down to issues like the third access, which to us individually, without the neighbor's input, we don't really care from our perspective. But what I was told to do was work with the neighbors and that from the neighbor's standpoint, 
an awful lot of the neighbors, not all of them, because that's obvious from the public comments we've got. From the neighbor's standpoint, it was, please don't. And we ended up with a fire gate, which costs us a lot more to money to build on the end, on the end of Francis. So it is what it is. Those were the decisions that were made when the project got final approval. Um, I want to bring up a comment relative to the development agreement that's in the staff report where there is a missing item that is critically important to all of us, is that a development agreement is a signed contract, as, the, as Mr. Priest mentioned. That agreement gets recorded against our property. If I don't have that agreement in front of me that I can show to banks, to finance, to builders who want to come and build on things, then it doesn't really exist yet. That agreement was recorded on March 14th, 2019. To us, that's the critical date on when that development agreement happened. Did we not meet a lot of those dates that we originally agreed to in the development agreement? Absolutely, that's right, we didn't meet them. And, I, and I'm gonna do my best to try to explain to you what's happened chronologically with the property so you can see it. So I'm going to go quickly into a chronology on what's what's happened since the development agreement was approved and we started working with builders on the property. So after we got approval and even prior to that March 14th, we started working with a very well-known, very versed builder in Palm Springs that's done hundreds and hundreds of units in Palm Springs and we're in serious conversations and discussions and, and negotiations with him for almost a year. And we basically couldn't come to a meeting of the minds. We could not make a deal with him. I tried really hard. We went back and forth to the table at least three times. And it didn't happen. We were trying to bring a builder into the table. So we went in December of 2019. And we went and did a two-prong approach because we have the capacity to build homes as a builder ourselves. I'm a general contractor. We've recently built a tract out in Santa Maria that's got the same basic landscape architectural orientation as this project. And we are set up to be a home builder. So we went on one track with us being the home builder and we filed for the, the PD, the final PD, the full filing with houses, not just samples, but on every lot. We went to our bank, we got an agreement from our bank. That's the comment of, can you get financing? Yes, we did have an agreement with our bank. And we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on architecture, on landscape architecture. And the architecture we used is the same exact architecture that was approved by the AAC in 2014. We didn't change it. So there was a 180 reversal from what was approved to all of a sudden they didn't like it. And what they wanted was they wanted a spare design similar to what's over at Miralon, to what Mr. Cunningham built at Miralon. That's not Serena Park. We're not building seven and eight hundred thousand dollar housing at Serena Park. I know, Kathy, you asked multiple times during our hearings in our time, can you build housing that's available for the working middle class in Palm Springs? We're looking at, yes, modern looking housing, one story housing, but it's something that's more accessible to that population. That's what we're trying to do. It's a different look. And we're not looking to we're not looking to recreate Marilyn. Eric, you're past your 10 minutes, so if oh. we could wrap up and if you have additional comments, maybe we can do that during the rebuttal. Okay. Um, real quick on the underground utilities, there's 45 homes in Desert Park Estates. They have power lines in their backyards. Edison services those power lines from our property. Irrespective of the city's condition, we have to move those power lines. Those power lines have to go in existing, in Farrell and in Joyce in those short cul-de-sacs. When they go in those streets, that's about a two-year process to do. We can't get electrical hookups on our houses that back up to those power lines until those power lines are moved. We got to negotiate with 45 different homeowners over there and get them to put those power lines in their front yards along with the transformers and the junction boxes. That's a two-year process. We all, Williams came up with, they wanted clarification of that condition. We all thought it was self-evident 
But Williams asked for that clarification. That's why it came up today. In no way, shape or form are we trying to say we don't want to underground utilities. We have to. We can't build houses. You can't get a bank loan without those. The builder won't go forward with that condition unless we know that those can be done. And that takes time and it fronts our later phase, not up front a mile away on phase one. We're no change to the status quo whatsoever. It's a very, very simple little equation. Um, ask all your questions. I'm glad to try to answer that. I'm sorry with the time involved, I couldn't answer so many of the questions that you all had to staff and to me during the hearing. Uh, we will, uh, when after rebuttal, we will give you additional time and have you answer those questions. Great. Thank you. Okay, Madam Chair, I do have uh, a list of people who had contacted us to speak. Um, so we'll start with the people who contacted staff for, to speak. Um, and then people who would like to speak who, were, who did not contact staff, you can uh, use the reaction feature and raise your hand, or you can send a note in the chat and I will put you on the list. Our first speaker is Denise Jansen Eager, who has, you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Denise Jansen Eager. I live at 2527 North Whitewater Club Drive, Unit D in Palm Springs Country Club and Alexander Estates 2, which as you have seen from the maps, is like a fishbowl surrounded by the proposed 386 houses that would comprise Serena Park. Everything that occurs on that property affects the people living in the 200 homes that comprise our community. In the past five years, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Havram, Mr. Gurus, and Somas Investments have not been a good neighbor to us. Since 2016, when Mr. Taylor and Mr. Havram first made stringent promises to each of our five HOAs about permanently closing the gate at the intersection of Verona Road and North Whitewater Club Drive, repairing the wall around Verona, along Verona Road, closing the walk through entrance next to the gate, keeping the sand from glowing, grow, blowing, keeping the former golf course free, free of dead vegetation, debris, and trash from creating a fire hazard, and keeping homeless people from trespassing and squatting on the lands, which allows them to walk on our Palm Springs Country Club and Alexander State's communities causing vandalism. It has only been through repeated phone calls to Mr. Taylor, members of our five HOA boards, Code Compliance, Fire Department, Police Department, Flynn Fagg, David Newell, yourselves, and the City Council members that we have been able to force Mr. Taylor to make action to remediate the blight that continues to negatively impact our lives. After five years, he is still he has yet to still take action on keeping the front gates permanently closed or attempting to close the walkthrough entrance next to the gate, which allows people to walk and ride their motorcycles on the property. A few of the issues that have happened in the past five years, multiple fires, cement rocks thrown through people's windows, ATV, motorcycles, boom buggies racing throughout the property, large trash items dumped on, including equipment that the police said could be part of a portable meth lab, vandalism. Earlier this year, another homeless encampment was started on the property because they had not taken the necessary measures to protect it. They still have it. In reading the letters from Four Seasons residents to you who live along the wall that separates the two properties, it seems as if some investments have not been a good neighbor to them either. They write to you of damage caused by the roots of tamarisk trees from his property growing under the wall to into their backyards, in fact, affecting their systems, their water systems and patio foundations. I don't understand why they are, why they are willing to wait until 2025, which is when the houses nearest to them will be built to get these tree roots permanently removed. After five years of putting up with Somis Investments' cavalier attitudes towards protecting our safety, we are not willing to put up with and wait any longer. They have done nothing proactive to earn this modification. They have had enough time to find a builder to begin building the infrastructure and the first houses. Other developers have done it in Palm Springs during this pandemic. Why do we have to suffer for their lack of commitment to Serena Park? Based on their history, 
I even question whether they will follow through on individual promises that Mr. Taylor has made to each HOA when he builds the faith closest to it. If he has committed the promise, project, as he says he has, he should be forced to stand by his original agreement of paying the $3 million by November 1, 2021. Perhaps that will compel him to get started. Please do not recommend the City Council amend the development agreement or payment of the $3 million. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker we have is Jim McDivitt. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for letting me take a few minutes of your time to talk about my concerns about all the traffic that I have to fight every day to get somewhere from my home in the Gene Autry neighborhood. I have lived in the Arnico Courts part of my neighborhood for a long time. We are the homes in Gene Autry of the Escuela between North Whitewater Club Drive and Gene Autry Trail. If you aren't familiar with our part of Gene Autry, let me describe it to you. We only have two streets that we can use to go in and out of the Asquelio uh, to reach the rest of Palm Springs. Kind of sounds like Serena Park, doesn't it? And that brings me to my point. All our streets and cul-de-sacs in, in our Nico ports wind around to these two streets. So first you hope they're not backed up when you get there. Then you pray that speeding cut through traffic on the Asquelio doesn't run you down. Traffic in and around our neighborhood continues to get worse. Once I finally got to turn on to the Escuela, I usually get to Gene Archery 12 pretty quick. But boy, some of these days you would think someone left the barn door open. Wow, the traffic is backed up on Gene Archery Trail and Vista Chino. I can see cars streaming down the Escuela to try to avoid the backups. And that is, despite these wonderful speed bumps that the city installed on what I call the Via Escuela Speedway. Now here comes Serena Park on the scene. I read they are going to have only two ways to get in and out with the main gate being at North Whitewater Club Drive in Verona Road. I was flabbergasted. All that additional traffic coming up and down nearby Whitewater Club up and down and across via Escuela. I tell you, it's going to be a mess. I frankly wish Serena Park was really going to be a park and not a big housing development, but I guess that's what's called progress. Anyway, I ask you on behalf of my neighbors and for the sake of my neighborhood and my driving sanity, please find a way to spread out the traffic more with other neighborhoods. Make them put another gate or even two more. I'm sure the developer will be able to afford it with selling those hundreds of homes at today's ridiculous prices. Please respect my neighborhood and help us. Thanks for listening and for everything you do. Thank you. Um, the next speaker we have is Mark Lenquist. Hi, good evening, Planning Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to address you and for what you do for our city. My name is Mark Lindquist. My husband and I own a home on North Whitewater Club Drive in Gene Autry neighborhood located one block from East Vista Chino Road near its intersection with North Gene Autry Trail. I mention our home's proximity to these major roadways for this reason. In just a little over a year and a half since we bought our home, traffic has increased tremendously on these roads, causing cut through traffic on our Gene Autry neighborhood streets. As commissioners may know, there is no traffic light to get out onto Vista Chino from Whitewater Club Drive. Many days, the volume of traffic forces you to dart into the middle turn lane before merging. As commissioners do know, the current plans for the Serena Park development have my street as one of the primary feeder roads to the main entrance. I was amazed when I found out the city was going to allow a major development of almost 400 homes which would mean almost 800 plus cars to have only two entrances and exits. Additionally, I saw in the plans that the Northern entrance exit would direct people away from the direction many people are going to want to go, which is towards Walmart, Home Depot and our major commercial retail areas. 
With all due respect to those who do traffic studies, it's hard to imagine that many residents of Serena Park are going to wind their way through the development, past the Golden Sands Mobile Home Park and onto Sunrise Way to get somewhere they want and need to go in Palm Springs. Let's face it, most drivers are not that patient these days. That means most of the cars are going to head towards Verona Road or more likely my street to get on Vistachino or Ginotri Trail. I'm tr tremendously concerned about traffic backups occurring frequently on Whitewater Club Drive, resulting in an increase in accidents happening on Vistachino and even more, more impatient cut through traffic speeding down adjacent Ginotri neighborhood streets as people race to try to make up time. That crush of traffic is going to make my street and other neighborhood streets very unsafe. I respectfully request and strongly urge commissioners to mandate a third entrance exit in this development, one that makes sense in terms of getting people where they want to go. It seems an easy solution to open the currently designated, open the one currently designated in the plan for emergency vehicles only off Farrell and Francis Drive or the Feral Racket Club option mentioned in news reports from 2016 as a possibility. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next speaker is James Green. David, could you put that uh, schematic that I, that map that I sent you, is it possible to put that up when I'm speaking? It, I've got it shared right now. Oh, excellent, all right. My name is James Green. I'm a vice chair of the Gene Autry Neighborhood Organization, leading our efforts regarding Serena Park and Casa Verona. I appreciate the opportunity to make a few additional points regarding Serena Park and voice concern over how those plans could add significant traffic to our streets. Our organization and our, and our residents are supportive of the development of this property if it if adheres to our three goals, which I stated in the July meeting, smart traffic management, appropriate housing density, and quality land development. Traffic planning is critical to any major development and how it interacts and affects the quality of life in surrounding areas. When built out, Serena Park, currently passive land, will add traffic from 400 homes to the surrounding neighborhoods. A second adjacent development called Casa Verona could add another 31 homes, and that is if approved by you in the very near future for a zoning density variance. That's a total of 417 homes. Put that in perspective, the Gene Autry neighborhood has 595 homes. The traffic flow and circulation from this large new development will be extremely important to get right. The current development plan for Serena Park, as we all know, calls for only two access points a main entrance at the intersection of North Whitewater Club Drive and Verona Road, and a secondary on Golden Sands Drive at the far north of the property. In comparison, Gene Autry neighborhood has six access points. A five-year-old traffic analysis by city staff regarding Serena Park indicated that they believed adding a third access point would not remove a significant number of cars from the other two access points. Given the scope of the development we're discussing, I would suggest that any traffic relief for Gene Autry neighborhood would be worth the minimal cost involved to the developer. The options for third access points exist and don't even have to be built. An email sent to our organization by a long-term North Whitewater Club residents observed, and this is about the Francis Drive possibility, quote, I have been by this opening in my exercise walks. I brought this up to David Newell, but was told that it was an emergency exit only. That is a waste of a perfect opening already there, end quote. And then, of course, there is the existing optimal entrance possibility of North Farrell, where it interacts with Racket Club Drive. These are all common sense solutions. And Kathy, I was thrilled to hear you use the two words, imminent domain. In conclusion, the Gene Autry Neighborhood Organization strongly urges commissioners to mandate a third access point in the Serena Park development. Please balance the needs of the city for more housing with consideration of surrounding neighborhoods like ours to, man to maintain our quality of life. Thank you for listening. 
Thank you. Uh, the next speaker we have is Roger Conway. Her phone here. I uh, want to comment on three things. One, I was very impressed with Eric Taylor initially when all of this started many years ago now in terms of reaching out to the community, taking time out to hear individual concerns and trying to be responsive. Uh, the second thing that really strikes me is the fact that the longer this property stays without any construction on it, the worse the situation is going to get for the I people the who live adjacent to it. My property is right on the borderline of the two streets, Golden Sands and Savannah Trail. Uh, we, we hear the fireworks that go off. We see the bottle rockets that sometimes hit the hammerous tree, which could cause a fire. Uh, we've watched people destroy the temporary fence that's there to get their dirt bikes out on the track. And yes, we're having to repair all of our hardscape because the tamarisk tree roots have basically caused pretty severe damage. At one point in time, Mr. Taylor's staff came out here, cut down a number of the tamarisk trees and treated them with a root poison. Uh, within 18 months, they started to grow back. There has to be a permanent solution to it or it'll continue to do damage all the way through to not only our patios now, but our foundations. So the question that I have is the city council, the planning commission needs to come up with a solution to remove an attractive nuisance. And they need to do it with some expediency. I see it as a matter of give and take in terms of all parties concerned, but the final outcome is something needs to be there other than an attractive nuisance. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And the last speaker I have is Daniel Faina. Unless there is anyone else who wishes to speak, please, um, as I mentioned, raise your hand or identify yourself in the chat. Thank you, commissioners. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Very good. My name is Daniel Faina. I am the Southern California Division President for Williams Homes, and we are the home builder and developer that is under contract to purchase the Serena Park uh, community in its entirety from Eric Taylor. Um, just wanted to speak to you tonight to tell you a little bit about Williams Homes. We are a family-owned um, home building and development company based in Los Angeles. We build all over the state of California, uh, Montana, Idaho, and Texas, but our home is Southern California. We are very interested in uh, seeing Serena Park come to life. We are very excited to partner with the community and bring all of the development and all of the home building to bear. We would be one builder building all of the entirety of the development, including all of the infrastructure that needs to go in. In our analysis of this community and our attempt to hopefully successfully purchase it and uh, carry the development forward, we have come up with the recommendations that are before you tonight. Um, that are really imperative for us to be able to have uh, a make sense opportunity that's viable uh, for us to be able to bring to life. Uh, we, we need the time um, to be able to complete uh, the work that's been started so that we can get development going and get homes under construction, hopefully next year. And, uh, you know, the deferment of the payment would uh, really allow us uh, the opportunity for this to make financial sense for us just coming into this. So I wanted to tell you guys, we're very excited. We have operations in the area. We are currently underway with projects we own in Cathedral City and in La Quinta. We are very much excited to uh, hopefully um, have the opportunity to carry this project forward in the event that these, uh, these date changes and the deferment of the payment are granted. So, and we're, we're available for any questions that you guys may have. Thank you. If you would stay here, I'm sure we will have questions of you. I will do so. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Taylor, you have three. Wait, Madam Chair, we have actually another speaker who is um, oh. uh, in the chat here. Uh, you know? Hey, good evening, guys. I'm uh, sorry, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? 
Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I really want to echo, you know, a lot of my neighbors in the Gene Autry neighborhood, um, James and uh, Jane, both the Jameses. Um, I think we're not opposed to the construction of the of the homes. We really want the um, commissioners for you guys to really give a third or don't approve it without the third gate um, access. I know that you know Mr. Taylor has worked hard and has probably spoken to residents that had been there a few years ago when the project was approved. But here you have neighbors that are opposed to just two access points. Um, I've lived in the neighborhood for four years, and we continue to see an increase now with traffic on both the um, Vista Chino and also on the uh, Via Escuela. So again, we're not opposing the the uh, construction of the homes. We would just like for you guys to revisit and open the plans again to allow a third access point or even a fourth. I know Mr. Priest mentioned that it would require for you guys to open those, but that's the right thing to do uh, before we can start any construction. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was the last speaker. Uh, if there's anyone else wishes to speak, please unmute your microphone and identify yourself. I think that concludes uh, comment, Madam Chair. Thank you. If Mr. Taylor is here. Yes. Um, I think we would like you to continue speaking. And uh, also, we will probably want to talk more with Mr. Farina. All right. Um, Kathy, what I'd like to do is maybe go through a little of details very quickly on the undergrounding of the utilities on what's going on out there. So the power poles in the back of the 45 houses in Desert Park Estates, that really does not, is not our under, not our utilities. Those are the utilities for the people who live in Desert Park Estates. The current status quo is when Edison services those power poles, they trespass or they go through our property with a distilled water truck and they spray off the insulators so that they don't snap, crackle, pop once a year, something like that. They go off and make sure that the, tra that the, the junction boxes are not sanded up and the transformers are still working. But when we build houses, net our 40 or 50 houses in our one of our last phases next to those power poles, we cannot block Edison's access. That's the status quo. So we have to underground those utilities out in Joyce, out in Farrell, in the existing city streets with a new public utility easement that they go through the front yards as opposed to where they're going through the backyards today. And we don't know enough until we get into detailed design. We understand the general concept, but we've got to go meet with each and every one of those owners, figure out where their utility box connection is. Have they built a side yard fence and it's down in the backyard? There's, those utility boxes have to be accessible from the street and we've got to work with them. And what happens if uh, Uncle Joe's 92 years old that owns the house is now moved to retirement in Kansas and we've got to go track him down and he doesn't want to have anything to do with this. And we need to get that done in order to underground those power poles. And we're going to come back to the city and say, OK, here's the dilemma. How do we deal with this? Because we have to underground those utilities. We can't build houses back there until we do. That process is a couple of years. So when we got our conditions of approval, our subdivision that comes adjacent to those houses is not going to be done for a couple of years at least at the end. So our subdivision at issue today is a mile away, much further to the east. It doesn't have any effect or negativity whatsoever to what we're building today. There's really no connection. So if you look at our project, which is approved as a phase project, as David showed us, then that makes perfect sense to underground those utilities when we do 3B, not 1A. But if you just take the condition all on its lonesome, it says underground them now. Well, that doesn't work because no one would ever build this project based on Uncle Leo in Kansas saying no, that could hang us out for two or three years. No one's gonna be able to get a bank loan. No one's gonna be able to actually build anything until this is resolved. So we asked the planning staff for clarification 
on how that condition is to be interpreted by the city. We're not asking for a change of the condition. And as attorneys like to say, there your condition is basically belts and suspenders to the existing condition that Edison would require. Edison would never let us build houses there or give us connections without us undergrounding those til- utilities. We have to. There's no question about us having to do it. It has to be done. Um, you had dozens of questions from all of you about this. I, I couldn't even begin to do them, I think, in under 20 minutes to 30 minutes, and I'm not asking for that. And we're um, past three minutes. So it's so, so I'd like to this, allow the applicant to continue. At this point, I'm going before I close the public hearing, I'm going, we're going to ask you questions, and we will also ask Mr. Farina questions. Great. Uh, on on this issue, before I open it up to the commission, there was a question of have you or Williams Homes met with Edison to see how this would be done? We have contracted with uh, MSA, our civil engineer and their utilities department, and we have asked them to go meet with Edison and come up with the process to do this and how they would like to proceed. So they have, my understanding is they have done that. We need to go then to Edison and create a contract with Edison as to doing that work. And have we created that contract? No, we have not. There's a payment, there's a substantial payment to do to make that contract start. And when, once we start the project, that's one of the first things we're gonna do because of the lead time involved to do this, even though it has nothing to do with our phase one. Okay. Uh, Shall I leave this open to other members of the commission for questions? I'm going to start with Mr. Roberts. You had questions. Do you want to go forward? Um, Many of my questions have already been answered. Um, They were really from staff, more from from the developer. Um, I'm ready. I'm ready to deliberate on this project. So I will. um, I will let others ask questions. I'm ready to do that as well. Uh, Commissioner Maruzzi. I'm a little confused about the relationship with uh, Mr. Faina and and, uh, Mr. Taylor. Is, what's the name of your firm, Mr. Faina? Williams Homes. Is Williams Homes buying the entire project from Mr. Taylor who will then drop out completely from all of this? And if so, when will that happen? Yes, we are under a binding purchase and sale agreement to purchase the property. So when Mr. Taylor says we, he's referring, he's speaking for you. It uh, depends on what item you're referring to. There are many things that the seller is carrying forward, you know, during the process before we, we would ultimately own the property. I'm confused by that. So when Mr. Taylor says, and Mr. Taylor, you can certainly answer this. We are going to be doing the undergrounding of the utilities in future years. Will it be you or will it be, you know, Mr. Faina? Mr. Maruzzi, it's very, very good question. Very appropriate. We didn't get into the details of that. I'm glad to, I'm glad to explain. So when we work with a merchant builder, we work with what we call a, a structured take ground. We own the land. And then we work with the builder and the builder takes down the land in pieces, but we still own the remaining pieces. The builder has to, uh, Williams has to own the land Mm -hmm. in order to get loans to build the houses, sell the houses and close escrows to the buyers. And then there are, as you've seen, a phasing exhibit that David presented, and we will own the remainder of the property. So the undergrounding in Desert Park Estates technically would be our end responsibility if Williams does not end up closing those future phases. But Williams would come and do the contract with Edison, do the coordination with Edison, and we would be involved with Williams watching that process so that if Williams got halfway through and we had another 2008 happen, 
then we end up with the property in phase 3B, and we have to know what's going on, and we would have to assume those costs. Okay, I think I got that part. Makes so sense? Who, yes, thank you. Who will pay the $3 million fee? If the, the way that the $3 million fee is structured is if there is any closing on the property, Williams buys 80 lots from us, and they own them. The city gets a... Pro, uh, the $3 million divided by 386 gives you a prorated fee per unit times 80. Williams has to pay that money to us and we pay it to the city as part of that closing. We cannot close the deal with Williams. That's an encumbrance. So there's never been yeah. a, a flat $3 million that would have to be paid in a certain date. It was always going to be prorated over the length of the project? It was prorated up till November for is prorated up till November 1st, 2021. At that time, the full $3 million is due today. The request today is to extend that for one year. Williams theoretically will close one or more phases prior to 2022, if that is indeed approved by the city council. And every time Williams closes, as you've seen their revised schedule, every time Williams closes lots, then the prorated share gets paid. But then when it hits the, the magic date of whatever it is uh, next year, right. the remainder would have to be paid. Correct. But not necessarily by Fana, Mr. Fana. It would be, well, it could be you, Mr. Taylor. Anyway, all right, I think I got the picture. Thank okay. you. You're is there a reason you haven't shared this agreement with the city and let them go forward with this hearing, not letting us know that you have an agreement to sell you have an, a contract we as soon as we got into the very earliest negotiations with williams and so you know i i also am a builder in california i built a competing project next to williams in the city of santa maria the land mr farina's land acquisition manager for this Used to be my boss at ER Horse. Yeah, we don't. We don't need to know that. But we just. But, I but just anyway, as soon as, as soon as I knew that we had we had an agreement, then I had discussions with two city council members, with Flynn, with the city manager's office, and said, "This is what we're doing." That was disclosed in January of this year to the city. Uh, at this point, I, I don't see other questions. Do people have questions of Mr. Farina? Mr. Farina, are you going to be building all the roads out? That's correct. We would do all of the horizontal land development, um, roads, infrastructure, and build the homes. Do you know that there is no approved design for the homes and that you have a um, a double vetting process you have to go through? Yes, we are aware of having, of going through the architectural review process. And you're asking to, uh, by March of 2022, to be at a point that you are in construction on the homes, which means you've got utilities, undergrounded roads built, um, sewers and other things in place. I believe the date for March of 2022 is to have our improvement plans, which would be for the horizontal land development. That would be to have the plans approved. So we could begin with the horizontal land development. So that would precede the actual vertical home building. But when would you have your, I mean, there's, there's work to do to develop the lots. Mm -hmm before you develop the homes, when would those be built? I believe our schedule contemplates that mid next year, we would be beginning home. So just under a year from now. So the, the schedule that we got from the city is not very, that's in the development agreement and the modifications is pretty inaccurate or un, unexplanatory in terms of what's going to happen when. I believe it covers the dates. Uh, if Mr. Newell could could bring it back up, that we the contemplation is that we would start uh, 
have improvement plan approval and record the phase one map that would precede any physical construction to the infrastructure on the site. That's for March of next year. Um, so that's when we would begin infrastructure construction as well in March of 2022. Uh, closing our first phase one home is contemplated for December of 2022, which means we would need to be starting our first home about one year from now. If you're contemplating, we're in 2021, closing your first, first, your first home, if it takes roughly a year, you need to be in construction of just in December of 2021, don't you? No, we would, we need to begin construction of our first physical home within one year from now to have our first homeowner living there in December of next year. And what date do you have to, do you have to start that home? We would have to start that home ideally July, August of next year. So this, ha this schedule that's before you has us be getting our improvement plans approved in March of 2022, beginning infrastructure construction in March of 2022, and beginning actual home construction uh, four or five months later uh, in the summer of 2022, completing our first home in December of 2022. How are you financed? Um, we we would be closing on this acquisition with uh, equity that's currently on our balance sheet. So we have uh, we we can demonstrate financial capability to build the entire project. And do you do you get financing as you build the homes, or are you building those with equity on your balance sheet? We will, we will do vertical construction with some level of construction financing. What is some level? Uh, we can only finance a certain percentage of vertical home construction with, with debt. What percentage? Depends on what the banks will allow us at that time, but anywhere from 50 to 75% of the cost. And you said you're in construction on two different developments. Would they postpone? Um, I, would would that post or limit the amount of financing you can put into this project? No, not in any way. Do other people have questions of Mr. Farina? One of the questions I have is when and how are you going to remove the roots of the tamarisk trees? Every letter we got from, uh, there are several items on the property itself uh, that are problematic for residents there. Uh, I believe you might be able to limit the homeless encampments or the drive-throughs but not the other problems, the fires, the, um, the tree intrusions. How are you going to handle that? And when are you going to handle that? Uh, what I understand about the trees and I have toured the property several times and been around the entire perimeter uh, to the existing neighborhoods. Uh, our understanding is that the trees and the invasive roots will be dealt with as a function of grading as we move through the different development phases of the property. Um, and then as far as securing the property, I can tell you, you with the investment we're planning to make here that we will be very focused on, on keeping the property secure. So the, the removal of the tamarisk trees will be the grading so in the very last phase of the property and when do you intend to get to the last phase because that's the phase where it will it, it actually i believe interferes with adjacent homes so i believe our development schedule and it it's reflected somewhat in the development agreement re revised dates 
has us uh, starting the final phase of development in 2024, 2023. And um, why... In your negotiations, why aren't you requiring that the fee, the $3 million fee, be paid by Mr. Taylor's group up front? I mean, we intend to to pay our, our appropriate share of the development fee. We just can't make a viable project that we can finance um, if we have to pay it up front. So, and... I, I can't speak to the, you know, whether or not we could force or try to force the seller to do so. That's just our ask. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else for questions? I'm going to turn this to the commission for deliberation. Commissioner Song has a question, Madam Chair. Commissioner Song, sorry. Oh, it's all right. Uh, Mr. Finally, so you have reviewed the uh, architectural uh, uh, ARC comments on the review, and do you do you plan to address them on the submittal to the ARC again differently? What's your plan of action? Yeah, we'll we'll definitely be preemptive with any feedback that's been given in the development of our initial submittal for architecture. So you so you're planning to uh, revise or come up with a design that's addressing the issues that were brought up by ARC. Yeah, we we plan to put forth our own our own design and work with with within the architectural review process to get that approved. Okay. And Mr. Taylor, when you do the underground for the utilities out on the public street, um, have you have do you know if with MSA that you need um, special easement or construction easement to have access to the private uh, property in order to um, do with the underground? Have you have you dealt uh, or understand the scope of how to have access to the private residence? Yes, each private residence has to be contacted individually and the design has to be shown to them and they have to agree to the um, the reconnection of their house from the street side as opposed from their backyard side. So sort of a, a bit of a logistic question. How can you do that work when the housing construction um, is going at the same time? The housing construction would not go at the same time. So as soon as we start with phase one, as soon as Williams actually executes and gets started, then those discussions need to start at the same time because of the lead time. Um, the way that the city's condition reads and the way that Edison functions, we, a, a builder, would not be able to have assurances that they would be able to build those homes until those homeowners agree. So without that certainty, you can't get a bank loan. You can't go forward. No, no rational person would go forward building homes, not knowing if they actually have all the final agreements of those 45 homeowners, roughly, speaking, and there's about 50 homes in Serena Park that would be affected that that would not be able to go forward with. So it is located in that in that isolated area backed up to Desert Park Estates in our phase three. So that that area that that problem needs to get resolved um, with those homeowners. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the last question is, if all 40 homeowners don't sign off, that means that the tamarisk trees don't get removed, the grading isn't done, and the problems for the people at the trailer park, those 40 homeowners, and the people um, in four seasons don't get resolved. In that, in that particular area on the project, that is correct. That has to get, that's a problem that has to get fixed. 
Edison has to have access, Kathy, to those power lines in the backyards, or they need to get moved, one or the other. The only other alternative is an awful alternative. I've done it before, and I wouldn't ever want to wish it on anybody, and it would require us to redo our map, which would be we'd have to build a service road in the backyards to service those power lines if a bunch of people say no. And that becomes a no man's land, and then the same dumping and the tamaris and all the problems we've got still remain. That's not an acceptable situation. So we have to get them to agree to let us build out, you know, out in Joyce and out in in Farrell and put in. And it's for their best interest. Their property values increase. They have modern. They have modern new lines for for power, for cable TV, for telephone. How many proposed lots are there? in Serena Park that this particular issue of that? A approximately 50. I mean, I might be off so for four. In the event that you cannot execute with the homeowners, you know, Uncle Bob and Spokane, right. would you forego building those 50? Don't, don't know yet. What we'd probably do is we'd probably come to the city and try to problem solve. That would be the first thing. And we'd throw out various alternatives on what's, how do we, how do we deal with this? But that, that sounds like the worst case scenario to me. To yes. Reduce the unit count by 50. That, that would be, that would be a yeah, catastrophic worst case scenario, but that's correct. Well, I don't know if it's catastrophic, but it's, it's a scenario. Right. Yeah, Edison has to have access to those power poles. No, I understand all that. I was just asking the question. Yeah. But would it impact the rest of the homes in that last phase? No. Or only those 46? Only those homes. Uh, question for Mr. Farina and Mr. Taylor. Will you... Please hand, can you hand a copy of your contract to our um, development director? I would say no, Kathy. That's a protected by a non-disclosure agreement. That's a private contract between us and Williams Homes. And so we have no evidence that you actually have a contract. If you look at it that way, it is what it is. I mean, we could get a certification from escrow that there's an open escrow on the property to demonstrate that. Jim, what do we need for this? It's very hard. I, it's very hard to deal with this on trust. Um, you know, if, if, some of the suggestions the developer is making may provide those assurances to the city. Um, if they have a non-disclosure agreement to not uh, disclose the contents of their contract, their private parties, um, I don't know that we could compel a copy of the agreement, but perhaps if there are some alternative assurances uh, from a financier or a banker or something like that, or um, I'm sorry, from uh, another party for the escrow, something like that. That's a good choice. A tricky situation. Can, can we start deliberations? Yes. Uh, the public hearing is closed. So, Madam Chair, if I could suggest that we deliberate on the three proposed points for amendment separately, um, you might start with the uh, issue of the utilities, move to the schedule. And then finally, the payment of the $3 million. We were going to do that, but we will also discuss the condition of the property and and the gate, the gate issues. Uh, we'll go to those. Um, Commissioner Hirschbaum, I, um, yeah. I, I think we have to discuss this. I'm just getting, I want to get a sense of the commission in terms of concerns before we go to separate items. Commissioner Maruzzi. Ultimately, I want to know if this project didn't go forward, 
would this be a situation where we have a vacant property languishing for who knows how long, and that won't be good for anyone, any of the neighbors or the city. So I, it, it is based on trust ultimately. Um, but that is ultimate, that is my concern. I, you know, if, if we can't come to some kind of a conclusion or agreement that Mr. Faina is comfortable with, it seems like this project will fail. And I haven't asked that of Mr. Taylor, but that's my guess. And that means we'll have a vacant parcel forever or who knows how long until it's sold. So that's just a concern that I have in my mind. I don't exactly know how to resolve it. Uh, Commissioner Roberts. Thank you. Can we start deliberation on this? Because I have some thoughts and ideas on how to move this forward. Fine. Thank you. So I first want to start out by saying I've been dealing with Mr. Taylor and I've been dealing with this piece of land and this project for seven years. I've probably got 100 hours of work into this project. I've seen it from the very beginning to today. Um, Madam Chair, you have as probably almost as many hours minus what I have from city council. What right. I think you moved to city council before we spent a couple hundred hours on it. Again. So here's the situation. I have supported this project from day one and worked really hard to mold it on pure faith with Eric Taylor and the team that then was working on it. What I see happening today is I see that it's being sold. They don't have to show us a contract. They've told us there's a, an escrow for sale. We don't know what it's based on. They don't have to tell us. So what I think we need to do is answer the questions that are before us and put some teeth into any sort of an approval if we're going to approve it. So I'm gonna make this as quick as I can here. Um, you know, we're talking about what looks like a completely unrealistic building schedule to me. It, they have nothing. They've submitted little to nothing to the city. Uh, I'm sorry to be so harsh with you guys, but from my perspective, that's what I'm seeing. To have a house up in a year, a little over a year, I, I don't see how that's possible in the best possible scenario. So to me, what we're looking at is a lot of unrealistic promises, which is what we've been looking at for seven years. So, the, you know, with respect to moving forward on this project, they can't even seem to secure it, let alone move forward on its development. So, you know, as I've been listening to all these questions and all, this, all the responses we've been getting, what I've come up with is we've been asked to essentially do two things. We've been, we've been asked to, ex, to extend the period one year for the development fees. And we've, dis, and, um, we've also been asked to, um, you know, uh, um, move the performance schedule. And I think what we need to do is if we're going to recommend that to the city council, we need, a, we need a sign of goodwill because what we've got is seven years of unfulfilled promises. The least of it being just securing the property, showing the city and showing the neighborhoods some respect by at least keeping it clean and keeping it locked. There are ways of doing that. There, it's not that hard. What we've gotten a lot tonight is a lot of tap dancing about that. That needs to be done. So here's what I suggest. I suggest we either simply deny this and uh, their sign of goodwill will be paying the $3 million and then the city can enforce on maintenance of the property. The other option is a gentler option. The other option is to go ahead and approve what they want. But what I would suggest is that they're gonna take years to get this development off the ground if it's possible. There's not a whole lot we can do to help that other than what we've already been doing for the last seven years. So what I suggest is we have them prove it to us financially. So I suggest if we allow them to push the development fee for another year and, they, and, 
and they don't, then what we do is we put an escalator clause in, which would benefit the community. And I would suggest a 25% escalator clause that if they miss their deadline in one year to pay those development fees, it goes up another million dollars. And that development fee is attached to the land. So if they decide to sell the whole thing to Williams or somebody else, that development fee goes with the land and it can't be wiggled out of. With respect to the other condition is that they immediately, we give them weeks, not even months, to clean that property thoroughly, paint out the, the, all the graffiti, get all the garbage out of it and secure it once and for all, which is what they should have done back in 2017 when they were given the development agreement and they've never done it. And how do I know that? Because if they've been asked, they've been enforced on over and over and over again, and they've ignored it. Or if they've even tried to solve the enforcement, they've done it in such a, a crappy way that it hasn't worked. That clearly people with dirt bikes or other people are just pushing that fence down. So rolling back to my suggestions is we either deny this and send that back or make that recommendation to city council and let city council try to iron it out, or we send back the plan of approving it with the condition that we put in an escalator clause that in one year, they either pay the $3 million or it goes up a million dollars. And the other condition is that within a number of weeks, they clean the property and secure it and maintain it. And if they don't monitor that property on a weekly basis and make sure that people haven't violated the property, then that's a violation of the agreement. And there should be some penalties in there for that as well. So that's where I am on this. When you say secure the property, do you mean a new fence, a heavy fence that cannot be cut? It's not for me to determine that. There are ways of securing this property. Yes, it has to do with fencing. It has to do with lots of things. Most developers would never be allowed to get away with what they've gotten away with here, not monitoring it. They should have a security force that either lives there or is monitoring it every day, a number of times a day. So if people are breaking through their fences, they're repaired. If people are dumping, are being allowed to dump on the property, that has to be cleaned up the day it's found. They simply have never been, they've, they've ignored enforcement and the city has allowed them to do that. So I don't think it's for us to determine how they secure the property and how they monitor the property. It's simply that they do it. And it's part of their condition of approval if, if you all, my colleagues, decide you wanna go in that direction. I'm open to going either way right now, but um, you know my two recommendations now. Commissioner Hirschbein. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what Mr. Roberts just said. I like the idea of attaching the fee to the land uh, as, a, as a lien against the land. I'd like to address a couple of other issues though. One is uh, I understand the, um, the, the phasing problem with the underground and I'm, I'm willing to say that's, that's a doable modification to the agreement. Uh, so I, I think I'm okay with that. Um, uh, as Commissioner Roberts pointed out, that uh, uh, extension of time that they're asking for is absurd, but if they want to lock into that, so be it. Uh, but, but here's a couple of things that I'd like to change to what Commissioner Roberts had proposed. And one is um, I'd like to see some real earnest money put in, in terms of that fee. I don't want to wait a year, uh, another 25%, another 25%. I want to see some money November 21st of this year, and I want to see about a million dollars of it. And I don't care if it comes from the buyer or the seller or a combination of both, but the city deserves that $1 million after waiting all this time and then deferring the other $2 million another year I could see with the penalties built in. And then the third thing I'd like to see happen, because I must have read... 50 emails about these eucalyptus trees 
and it seems like these were promises. Okay. I'm sorry, tamarisk trees. Uh, it seems based on what the homeowners have been saying is that this was promised to be addressed years and years and years ago. And I would like to see this addressed now rather than waiting another three or four years for some hypothetical grading to take place. So I, I would like to see any changes to the development agreement be predicated on those items. And I could repeat them, tree removal, uh, the issues that Commissioner Roberts brought up, and a payment of a million dollars on this year. Mr. Roberts, are you in agreement with that? Sure. I mean, I, yeah, I think that's fine. If you want, if you want to extract uh, some money right now, um, that's fine. The other thing that we might want to do is create an escrow account for maintenance of the property and monitoring. Um, they can't seem to keep it clean or locked. Um, so maybe we have to do it, um, but we need money from them to do it. And um, maybe that's something else. So I think what I would suggest, um, Madam Chair, is we start collecting all these different ideas and then try to craft an action on this. Flynn, are you keeping a record of these? But I want to hear from my colleagues on whether others even want to move forward with this or whether they want to just move to deny it. Yes, Mr. Newell and I are keeping a record. Miscellanean? I, I agree with uh, both Commissioner Roberts or Vice Chair Roberts and with uh, Commissioner Hirschwein. As uh, JR was going through his two, two options, the one caveat I was putting in my mind uh, was yes, but we need 500000 to a million dollars down now. I don't think that um, I can, in good conscience, make the findings that we need to make about the protection of property values um, and about the general benefits without some degree of trust that the developer is going to perform. And I think the payment of hard money um, up front does help build that trust or that belief that it is actually going to happen because at this point, um, there's not enough skin in the game. Uh, and I also agree that um, I, I take no exception to the proposed uh, phasing of the underground work. Commissioner Song. Um, yes, in the, in the same tune, what I was thinking is in the amount of half a million dollar, and if there's no progress, no uh, movement on the project, um, you know, next year, that the half a million dollars, it's down to zero and the $3 million is due again. Um, and that it's a little bit more um, direct in the sense of that in the activity needs to happen or it's half a million dollars that uh, it will be lost. Um, that's along the line that I was thinking. And then also uh, to, to encourage uh, either exit only or some some sort of traffic uh, evaluation of exiting from the project. Commissioner Irvin, do you have comments? Yeah, um, I, I would like to say the other commissioners are being extremely nice. Um, I just feel like what we're going to be here uh, in the same situation in another, another year. Um, we don't have anything. Uh, we're being extremely generous. Uh, me personally, um, I, you know, not to be, you know, mean to our, our, um, our applicant, but I, I'm in denying it. So um, that's where I am with it. Commissioner Maruzzi. Uh, I think we can craft, uh, I don't think I want to deny it, but I think we can craft a um, a good resolution to this with all of the different ideas that have come about. And I'll support that. Uh, I just want to give my thoughts on this. I think we want to do this in the alternate. Uh, what I would like to suggest is what's been suggested 
that there's a million dollars up front, and this is recommendations to the city, that it be lost and $3 million is owed if they don't meet the timeline that they've given us. I think it's unrealistic, but I think they've told us they would do it. And if they don't deal with the tamarisk trees and secure the property, the alternate would be to the city council that if they can't exact that, that we recommend that they turn it down. So I, I don't want to just pass it. I want to say that we've seriously considered turning it down. And the only way we would be comfortable is if there's an increase in the fee um, or a million dollars put in now that is lost if they don't meet the timelines they give us. The other thing is that I would recommend to the council, because it's the only thing we can recommend uh, in terms of the entrance, and I have no problem with the undergrounding of the utilities, I would like to say that if they can't get those agreements, that I would like them to agree to go forward with phase four with the rest of the properties and leave those 40 units not built. Um, I would suggest to the council, and it's the council's decision, that we recommend that Francis Drive be opened as a third entrance. I don't think we can, we can ask the council if they would consider eminent domain of the um, entrance that's off of Farrell. Uh, I think that's the only way we would ever get that. Uh, it's probably a long shot on private property. But the Francis Drive, my memory is the only reason we didn't do Francis Drive as an entrance and an exit was the neighborhood didn't want it. That's what I remember as well. And so I would suggest that we suggest that, that what we've gotten is testimony from people that they're concerned about traffic and that we ask the council to consider opening up the agreement to that extent. Um, but that's kind of where we go with this. Um, I, I would rather see this built. I've always wanted this built. I've always liked it, but I've, I've been concerned because nothing has happened that we're just going to babysit this property for several more years, each year being asked for an additional extension. So I think we need earnest money. Um, and uh, I also think we need to set a timeline for them securing the property and dealing with the tamarisk trees. Shall I try to um, craft uh, an action here? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I've, I've, I've heard um, everybody's recommendations. I think they're all good. Um, I think the first message that we want to send to council um, director is that the planning commission still supports this project, but no longer has faith in their ability to move forward. And so what we need at this point is faith. And that faith needs to take the form of some money and some action. So the first thing that we'd like to see is we'd like to see the property thoroughly cleaned of, of, of all garbage and, and dead foliage. And we need the property secure. And that needs to take place immediately. The city needs to see a contract with a security company for regular monitoring of the property, daily monitoring of the property. The city should also have an, an escrow account should be open with the developer, which should be funded by the developer for a certain amount of dollars, which will come to, to maintain the property if the developer continues to make promises and not maintain the property. We need to, the message to the neighborhood is a message of respect and safety. 
I'm hearing from my colleagues that they'd like to have $1 million of the $3 million paid on the due date in November that all $3 million was due. I don't know what that exact date is, but it's this, um, it's this coming November, whatever that day was. November 1st. Yeah, and that money is money that is given to the city free and clear toward acquisition of future public lands, which is what it was meant for in the beginning. If the, whoever the owner is in one year, isn't able to pay the rest of the $2 million, then there's an escalator clause that will add another million dollars as community benefit, additional developer fees. And then run with the property. Thank you. And that this is a lien to the property. We'll let the uh, city attorney draft exactly how that looks whether it's a covenant or probably a lien. So again, if this property is sold to anybody or goes into bankruptcy, this lien exists favoring the city of Palm Springs. The $2 million and then potentially additional million dollars that might occur a year from November. Um, what did I miss guys? The schedule. Uh, the schedule for. The, uh, are we approving the schedule, the changes in the schedule that they have asked for? I'm going to suggest that we do because I think they're unrealistic anyway, and I don't think we can determine that schedule. I think we need to leave that to staff and the developer, whoever it ends up being. Um, that's going to go round and round. I again, I don't mean to be cynical or negative. But I think what the, what Mr. Fena has suggested and what Eric, Mr. Taylor has suggested is completely unrealistic. But again, there's no way we can determine that right now. I yeah, think we I, have to. Leave. I, I I agree with you on that. I think I'm okay with the schedule as they wrote. We, you know, if you build in all those monetary uh, remedies, let them come up with the schedule. Yeah, they, this may drag on for years, but as long as the city is getting the development fees it was supposed to get, as long as it's serving the community, as long as the property is being maintained, it's clean, it's safe, I think it's the greatest service we can do from all the neighbors that are suffering with this property. So basically what we're saying with the schedule is, okay, if this is the schedule you guys want, you got it. We want to encourage you to move forward with your development. Uh, we're not going to put any unrealistic um demands on you it's up to you to work with the city on that and we'll help you in any way we can but in the meantime as a show of goodwill you need to pay the city some money of the developer fees to show that you're real and not just dragging us along for another year as it has been for the last four and then the, the other item was the removal of the cameras tree. okay so are we in agreement that the, all the towers trees should be removed Yes. The point the, the one gets into the res existing residences. Okay. So, um, Director um, Fag, uh, you know, you may have to come up with the wording and how that's done exactly. We know it can be done because what was it two years ago? We just removed a whole lot of Tamaris trees, and we know what it costs to do that. Um, Mr. Mr. Roberts, can I ask for clarification on one thing? Previously, you said you would recommend to the city council that without meeting these conditions, that the request be denied. Did you want to make that part of your yes. recommendation? Yes. And if at any point, if at any point they don't pay the money and then maintain the property in a clean, safe condition, the deal is off. They have to come back. We're not asking a lot. We're asking something they should have done five years ago, which is to truly secure the property and monitor it. That's all it takes. It's it, not even that expensive. So Commissioner Roberts, though, who, who makes that determination if the property is continuing to be maintained 
Are we'll you- hear it in complaints and enforcement will go out and an enforcement comes back and says, fences are down, there's dumping going on. Basically what, if, if complaints come in, they'll go to the city, the city should be able to go to the developer, whoever the owner is and say, you have a few days to solve this. And if they don't solve it, that means they're in default. What's been happening is they haven't been solving these problems. Tie it to default. Yeah. That we, what we have to do is when complaints come in, they need to be given a certain amount of time to, to solve the problem. And they need to be given a week or so to solve the problem. If they don't solve it within a certain amount of time, they're in default. And uh, the agreement can go void quickly. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I, I've heard the comments of Mr. Roberts and the rest of the commission. I, I understand where you're going uh, in concept here. Um, I think our office would like to look at these a few, uh, maybe for one meeting or uh, something like that. And Well, let me defer to staff on this and get staff's take on it. I, I, I'd like to be able to flesh out the details a little bit more. I don't know whether staff feels this would need to come back to the planning commission for a final recommendation or whether we could take these, work the details in and take them directly to the council. I think it might be better to come back. Yeah, I'm wondering if it might be. Uh, mm-hmm. Director, what do you think? I, actually, I feel that we're fine. We understand the intent of the planning commission. We've taken good notes. Okay. Mr. Priest, we can confer with you. This item is scheduled to go to City Council on the 30th. If there's any issues that remain unresolved, we can come back to Planning Commission on the 22nd uh, to finalize them. But again, I think you've been quite clear in terms of your direction. It's a matter of working with Mr. Priest in the language uh, that is put forth for City Council consideration on the 30th. I think that's good, but I would I would also suggest that once you all get it into a form for city council and draft form, it goes back to the chair um, um, of the planning commission to ensure that it is our, our intentions are, are, are in there to go. To the Certainly, council. we would be happy to do that. And the, the, city council. the other things, JR, that I would include in that is a a firm recommendation that we open up the Francis Drive gate for entry and exit? Well, I think I think we're getting a little into the weeds. I absolutely agree and have always agreed. And Kathy, you know what we've been through on this with the neighborhoods, that a third opening needs to be opened. And whether it's Francis Drive, or whether it's another, there were other options. One of the options was to move out into the, um, into the, uh, what do you call it? The, um, the, the river that runs next to it. But that was a very expensive option, which was to create a new driveway out of the property. And the, and the tribe wouldn't allow it. Well, the tribe had problems with it, but the developer talked us out of it. And we and we were friendly with them at that point and said, okay, we'll try to find another alternative. But why don't we leave it then that we still strongly recommend a third entrance? Third entrance, absolutely. That, that council didn't take our recommendation last time, but it's still an issue and it's more of an issue than it was five years ago. Yeah, the issue that we're having with this neighborhood, as you'll recall, that made it so complicated is all of these different neighborhoods naturally don't want an entrance near them. So they, they, they're all arguing for different places. And so it will take us or staff or somebody to determine what the right solution is. We're never going to get full agreement with the neighborhood associations. We tried that for years, remember? Oh, I do. So we can certainly put in that we strongly suggest that the council also work with the developer to come up with a third, a necessary third egress. So do uh, is that final? Do you want a date? Flynn, do we need a date on the tamarisk trees? It would be helpful to have a time period. So, for example, within, you know, 120 days. I think 120 days to remove the tamarisk trees is good. Okay. And I'd like to give them, 
Maybe, again, I think it's, I, I, I think Commissioner Urban's right. I think we're being extremely generous, but give them 30 days to clean and fully secure the property and show the city a contract with a security company for daily monitoring of the property and, and daily repairs where necessary in the fencing to keep people out and to, and to secure the other neighborhoods. The other thing is they do need to bring back to the city a phasing agreement from S, from um, Edison, that Edison has signed off on the phasing agreements. I think, but again, I think that's part of their schedule that they work out with staff at this point. I think- I don't think that was worked out with staff, was it, David? No, to be worked out. To be worked out. Yeah, but I think, again, I think their schedule is going to have to be reworked and reworked. It's completely unrealistic. Well, I would still, I would just say that they need to work out, we need staff to figure out a timeline where they need to come back with a phasing. We're in favor of the phasing, but they have to get a phasing agreement from Edison. Okay, that's fine. I just don't want to over convolute this for council. I want to keep it pretty clean and simple. I have a question though. You're saying 120 days to remove chemistries. Plain devil's advocate, if this agreement's in place, what happens on day 121 and they're not removed? They're in default and the agreement goes void. And is that a, is that written into, I mean, I know we're not crafting the agreement, but I mean, we've seen those agreements come and go before. So like, is this just another agreement that's gonna come and go? It could, but remember, at this point, we now have a million dollars. The million dollars needs to be paid immediately. No, and no, again, no. Default, the agreement could add the escalator clause. So they're going to pay out a million dollars. They, they, they're basically, we're asking them to put their money where their mouth is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skin in the game, I get it. A for a big developer is a lot of money to lose. And I think that if we extract a million and they're, it's at risk if they violate this agreement, I think they're going to finally get come to the table. Okay. Yeah. Madam Chair, uh, members of the commission, I would just point out uh, briefly uh, that if we renegotiate these terms, they are put into the, dis the uh, development agreement and then there is a default, there would not be an immediate voiding of the contract. Under the development agreement statute, there would still be a process where it would have to go back to the city council to terminate the agreement. And that's per the statute. Uh, but they yeah, could Jim, use the yes. default as the basis to terminate the agreement. Yeah, Jim, basically, I think what we're really counting on here is the escalator clause. It's not a punishment. It's simply an escalator clause and an encouragement to perform. Mm -hmm. I, we're not in any position to rewrite their um, agreement. That's all city council business. Mm -hmm. And for purposes of clarification, the escalator, um, I had heard... One million immediately, two million is delayed for an extra year per the extension that's been discussed, then an escalator cause. I'd heard one million dollars. Is that one million dollar one time? If they miss that, then it becomes three million. Yes. Uh, we're asking for a million dollars immediately to be paid to the mm -hmm. city and clear. Then we're saying we want to give them what they're asking for, which is a year extension on the additional 2 million. If they don't make that extension, a million dollar escalator clause kicks in. So they will now owe us $3 million again. Okay, a one-time $1 million escalator. Correct. Okay. Understood, thank you. Mm -hmm. And that it's tied to the land. Yes. Uh, yes, we will we'll explore the options there, whether it be a contractual lien or perhaps some other way of attaching that to the land. We want you to think of this in terms of the property being sold or potentially going into foreclosure. So we definitely want it attached to the land itself. We'll explore that. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else from members of the commission? One, one more clarification. If are, are we saying that we're giving the developer opportunity to look at the schedule again with these conditions so they can submit a more probable schedule? I, I'm suggesting this is gonna change over and over again, that uh, it's up to them to work it out with staff, that I don't think we can, 
punish them for changes in their schedule. We want to help them. We want them to move forward. The only, we're just asking for a show of goodwill, which is the million dollars and the, um, the cleaning and the maintenance and the, and the securing of the lot and the removal of the trees. Beyond that, I don't think we can control their scheduling. At some point, the city council is going to get sick of it and their development agreement is going to come into play. And I think the developer gets that at this point too. And it's probably sooner than later. Well, there, there, so there's three points here. One that is pretty clear to me, but I want to be uh, to, to summarize it in my mind is that one is that they're proposing a schedule which asks for an extension and we're all saying, yes, that's acceptable. We're also saying that we're, uh, we're allowing the facing of the overhead utilities but on number three, we're saying that the $3 million payment, instead of deferring it, we want the first million dollar when it was supposed to be due. And then we, ne we name the conditions of the uh, protection and uh, clearing of the site. I, so think you, I think you have it all right. The, the only thing that I think staff now understands is we're basically suggesting that they get everything they want. We're just making two cha three changes, three additional conditions, that a million dollars drops out in November as originally planned. Then they get the extension they're asking for, for the two million, but we're putting some teeth in it and saying, if you don't make the next extension, it will cost you the million dollars. Um, we will add them another million dollars back to the two. So and there is a time value of money. It, this has been postponed for a long time. That's putting it in one sentence, exactly. And the, and the community needs some community benefit here on this. And we need to, we need respect to the neighborhood and a show of goodwill. A respect to all the neighborhoods that are badly affected by this. Right, but yeah. one more question, sorry, one more thing, you know. But I, I, heard, I heard from the commissioners a tone of, uh, not forgiveness, but flexibility if this schedule is to change, which is the first point that we're allowing. We're saying yes to the new schedule. I would just, I would just leave the schedule as it is right now. Okay. Yeah, I think we grant their schedule change. I don't think there's much we can do with that. Chances are they're going to be coming back to staff soon with changes again. And staff will have to deal with that. All we're, all we're being asked to focus on is the extensions and the money. And that's what we're dealing with. So basically we're giving them what they want. We're just asking for a million dollars to drop out of it. And for once they be responsible to the land and the neighborhood and the city and maintenance of their land. Chairwoman, one, one more clarification or suggestion on, yes, a third uh, entry access should be strongly considered. But I would like to piggyback on what you say that the the most logical is the one that's close to Rocket Club and Farrell. Yes. I mean, do we want to have staff read back what they have to make sure they got it all? Trust us that we have what you have indicated. Please don't make me read it back. We do have the videotape to go from. Again, uh, Mr. Priest and I will work through uh, your recommended conditions. We will review them with the chair prior to city council on the 30th. Can we vote? Let's call the question. Do we have a, we have a motion? Do we have a second? Yes. Who was the motion maker? I was JR. Okay. Who is the second? I'll second. If you would call the question. Vice Chair Roberts. Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein. Yes. Commissioner Lane. Yes. Commissioner Irvin. Sorry, yes. Commissioner Marusi. Yes. Commissioner Song? Yes. And Chairwoman? Yes. Motion is approved 7 0. Thank you.
you all. Do we need a few minute break before we take up the next item? Yes. Five minutes, please. Yes. <laughs>
are back. Um, um, are we on TV? Yes. I'm calling the commission back. The next item is unfinished business. It is item 3A, Chad and Tenneth Dreyer, owners of a ma for a major architectural application and administrative minor modification application for the construction of a 5,846 square foot single family residence and a 576 square foot detached casita on a hillside lot located at 585 Caminos uh, Kalajat. Staff report, please. One second. Okay. Um, so the applicant is proposing a 5,846 square foot single family residence, a 576 square foot detached garage with a, I'm sorry, not garage, detached casita with a rooftop deck, um, subterranean parking on an approximately 20,000 square foot lot. Um, the lot is uh, sloped towards the northeast and it's currently surrounded by um, single family homes on all four sides. On June 21st, the ARC reviewed the application and voted to recommend approval to the Planning Commission subject to the following conditions. Replacing all the Washington Robusta with filifera, screening the ramp at the front, and planting landscape along the south and west property lines for privacy. On July 28th, the Planning Commission reviewed the project. Um, staff's recommendation was uh, for Planning Commission to approve subject to reducing the finished floor height um, approximately four feet um, per engineering. Um, as you may recall, the applicant is proposing their house at a finished floor height of 529 feet. The house on the south has a finished floor height of 530 feet, and the house on the north has a finished floor height of 522 feet. Um, because of the request by staff, um, Planning Commission requested the applicant uh, to do additional studies on the elevations. So they had asked the applicant to provide a south-north and west east elevation, which depicted the spatial relationship between the proposed and adjacent residences as currently proposed by the applicant. Um, and another exhibit that showed the spatial relationship um, with the reduced finished floor height um, as requested by the engineer. Um, so these exhibits are what the applicant has prepared. The very top, you'll see the proposed pad elevation um, at 520. Man, on those, it's hard to see. I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Is there a way to zoom in on those? It's hard to see. No, I don't think so. Are the images hard to see or the, is the text hard to see? Oh. Oh. Commissioner uh, Hirschbein, you have that in your packet, by the way. You have that drawing. Okay, what, what number is that? It's not numbered, it's the fourth page from the back. Okay. Okay, so um, the very first image that you see at the top is the proposed pad elevation at 529 feet and how it relates to the existing um, properties on the north and the south. At the very bottom is the pad elevation um, that is lowered by four feet as uh, requested by the city engineer. And the applicant did an additional study showing the pad elevation lowered by two feet to kind of um, just kind of give a compromise between the two. This next sheet you do not have in your packet. Um, it was sent to me today by the applicant and it shows the relationship between uh, the proposed 
residents uh, as it relates to the houses on the east and west side. So again, at the very top is the proposed pad elevation at 529 feet. Um, the bottom is what engineering had requested and the middle is um, the pad ele elevation lowered by two feet. This um, exhibit was also provided to us by- Since we don't have that, could you go back to that one? Oh, yes. Look at it a little more carefully. So the bottom one is what's proposed by the uh, engineering? Correct. And, and the house on the right is to the west of the proposed house is that right correct so that that house on the right is um technically the one in the rear the rear yeah okay all right and then where, where's the because this was my question where's the uh uh rooftop deck on those elevations on those sections so the sections i believe were just um asked for them for the main house i, I asked for the a section showing the relationship of the rooftop deck to the adjacent properties. Um, for us, if you could go back to the previous drawing. Yes. And highlight on the drawing where the rooftop deck is. Are you Just with your pointer? Do you your see mouth. it? Yes. That right there. I can't see that. Is there? Can you see the mouse? So no, it, it's on the left side of the proposed residence. It's that little, I guess, rectangular piece that's sticking above on the left side of the proposed residence. Correct. Got it. But go back to the one that shows the east-west section. Or sorry. Yeah, the east-west section. Mm -hmm. Approximately where would the rooftop deck be in section there? So that one's going to be on the right. I believe that's the glass. So it's a little, I, I was going to get to the rooftop deck in a second, but it's on the right-hand side of the proposed residence and it shows okay. just the sliver of glass that they're proposing. Okay. Got it. When you're here, um, it looks like, does, am I correct? Does the house move back the way they said? And is it just shortening the yard by the one section of the house, but the area where the pool and the casita are don't get shortened or? Right. So they provided this um, illustration um, to show exactly what happens to the residents as it gets lowered. So the red dotted line indicates the, lo the new location of the of the home, if it's lowered by four feet, it would technically be pushed back 14 feet. Why is that? That is a great question for the applicant. I mean, does the house get bigger as it gets lower? No, um, I think it has something to do with the slope. Yeah, the driveway slope is the issue. Yes. Oh, so the whole house gets pushed back. I'm sorry? The whole house gets pushed back. It's going to be the right side of the house, yes. But the pool doesn't get pushed back. The casita doesn't get pushed back. No. And the okay. patio area doesn't. Okay. Correct. Um, the orange line indicates the location of the building if it were lowered uh, by two feet, um, which is what staff's recommending. It would push the building back approximately seven feet instead of, you know, entirely 14 feet. So the rooftop deck um, we're going to talk about next. I just wanted to bring up that uh, during ARC, there was no discussion or comments related to the proposed rooftop deck, um, but the applicant was aware that there are issues um, and privacy concerns with the adjacent neighbors, so they wanted to address that. So the exterior, I'm sorry, these are the elevations of the casita. Um, they're not changing other than the south and west elevation. They're proposing a two-foot translucent glass um, to sit on top to, um, per, I guess, to add um, more privacy to the people within the roof deck and then the surrounding neighbors. Um, this is an illustration that shows how that uh, glass works. It prevents um, those in the rooftop deck from looking down into their adjacent neighbor's properties. 
And additionally, landscape that's existing and will be proposed will also um, aid in creating that privacy screen. Are we required to approve a roof deck or do we have the flexibility to approve it or not approve it? I think you have the flexibility. Ms. Perez is correct. You do have yeah. flexibility as part of a discretionary hearing where you can identify that there are impacts uh, to adjacent neighbors. And what's the finished floor dimension to the top of the translucent glass? I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? The dimension from the finished floor of the roof deck to the top of the translucent glass. Oh man, it's a little blurry. I believe it's 23 feet. No. No, I think it's more like five foot nine. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Five foot nine, okay. I was thinking from grade. <laughs> Okay. Um, this is just a rendering of what that glass will look like um, on top of the casita. The materials and colors have not changed. They're still proposing white and dark gray stucco on the main portions of the building with a champagne and dark bronze metal finish uh, for the siding and the framing. Here's the northeast rendering of the property. And then the southwest elevations of the main home. And I've provided a section plan showing the subterranean garage and how a majority of it is located underground. Their landscape plan is not entirely updated, but the applicant is proposing to, play, uh, to plant um, approximately 16 feet high trees or ficus along the south and west property lines to create that privacy screen between neighbors. Staff is recommending that the Planning Commission approve the project subject to the following conditions, replacing all the Washington Robusta with filifera, screening the ramp at the front, planting landscape along the entire south and west property line and reducing the finished floor um, elevation to 527.5 feet based on the additional information provided by the applicant. That concludes my report and the applicant is available for comments. Can you explain the recommendation as to why you went from 25.5 feet uh, and why you went to 27, your rationale, um, and what you think the impacts of that are. Let me go ahead and jump in and respond to that if you'll allow me, Ms. Perez. So in terms of the original recommendation from the engineering division versus what we are recommending to you today, based on the additional information submitted by the applicant and in looking at the amount of dirt that would need to be removed from the property in order to accommodate that and also looking at the uh, impact to adjacent residences we felt that a compromise position of 527 feet would be the most reasonable and result in the least impact to neighbors in terms of both the height of the pad and also the removal of dirt from the site so based on those reasons we are recommending 527.5 feet. Questions from the commission for staff? Uh, I, I have asked the architect to present to us as well, but if people have questions for staff right now, this is a good time to ask them. And I, can't, I have a question. Uh, it's getting dark and I can't see your raised hand. So uh, the little hand print. So if you just speak, that would be great. Okay, I'm gonna um, just jump in. Um, oh no, Lori had her hand up. I'll let you speak next. All right, you let me know. Okay, uh, I have two questions for staff relative to one of the letters that we received. Um, from a neighbor who has been very active in correspondence on this particular issue. The, the assertion or two assertions that the neighbor makes is one that, that uh, this would 
that we would be granting variances. And I want to confirm that there are no variances involved in this. Is that correct? The applicant is, I mean, feel free to jump in, David, if you want, but the applicant is um, requesting an administrative minor application, which is like a mini variance, but that's for the height um, of the proposed house. Okay, but it's not, it's not, you, we don't have to make the findings, legal findings for, required for variance, correct? That's correct. correct. Okay. Uh, and then my other question is, the uh, letter writer also refers to uh, precedent setting issues. I am not aware of anything in this that we're being asked to approve that would set a precedent that we might have to, that we might later regret. Is there anything, staff, is there anything in here in approval of any one of these uh, that would grant a uh, precedent? Or constitute a precedent? Uh, no, Commissioner Land, this is uh, reviewed on its own merit, uh, just as any other application is considered for minor modification. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Roberts, you had a question or question for staff? We can't hear you. Uh, yeah, sorry, I had to find myself on the screen. Um, so my question to staff is, and, and this may have to go to the applicant, on the north side elevation, I can't figure out the height of the ribbon windows in the center of the house. Um, I, I need to get the height, yeah. Uh, go to, yeah, there you go. So on that top there, that line of ribbon windows, what is the, 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 the height from the finished floor in that room to the lower part of the window? Let it me looks see like it's about six, eight, six, nine, but I can't tell for sure. Let me see. Alex, I can answer that. Okay. Yeah, thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity. Chair, that's seven foot six to the sill of that window. Okay, so people standing in that room can't see the house next door. They're they're looking over it, correct? They're focused on the ridge up above. They can't see down into the yard because it's you're saying it's seven and a half feet before right. the window even starts. Okay, uh, that was my question. Thank you. Other questions for staff before oh, Commissioner Song? Um, yes, um, Ms. Perez, has there been other uh, rooftop um, terraces in this uh, neighborhood that have been approved or proposed in the past? Not on the street that I'm aware of. There are others though on the next street. Correct. West. There are others in other hillside areas, yes. Is that to the west or to the west? I can check. Yeah, there are other homes. There's at least one that was recently approved for another home to the southwest of this uh, this property. Is that currently built? No, it was a recent approval. And Commissioner Song, I did walk the neighborhood this morning and I counted uh, 10 different locations where there were either rooftop nets or um, more frequently second stories with a balcony uh, overlooking some of the areas. So um, didn't seem to be out of uh, step with what else is going on in the neighborhood. Thank you. Other questions for staff? Uh, there being none, um, the applicant would like to speak and I thought it would be helpful for you to speak and present to us what you would like to and then we can ask you questions. 
Yeah, if I could just focus on the documents that uh, were requested, I think I can get through this pretty quickly. So, Alex, can you put up the first document with the front elevation and the three different grade heights? Yes. This is the one you're looking for, correct? Can you see it? Not yet. Okay, sorry, it stopped sharing. There you go. Okay, so our goal uh, is still to export as few truckloads of dirt as possible. Um, the, the top, the top design, uh, and we'll see when we look at the the elevation in the other direction, is uh, the least impactful to the site. Uh, in addition to that, when you look at the scale and massing of the home to the left and the home to the right, there's a lot of similarities. They were both built by the same builder. Um, they have higher roof heights than we do, so presumably higher ceiling heights. Uh, when you look at the relationship of the home uh, with the 595 uh, pad height, uh, with our 10-foot roof heights, and then we've got a little 11-foot-6 roof height, uh, you see that the massing of the home at that level is quite sympathetic to the to the two homes left and right. And one of the things that starts happening as the pad gets pushed down is it starts to feel kind of diminutive and starts to shrink into into the site in a way that I, it doesn't quite relate to what's going on. The other thing that you notice from all of these views is that the home on the left and the home on the right are up on an elevated pad off the street. So it's it's not like there's um, anything odd about uh, having the slope up to the pad. All the homes along this side are doing that. And Alex, if we can go to the next view, the one that you got today. Yes, one second. So if... Commissioners, if you can look closely, there's a green line that indicates the natural grade. Um, it's quite evident on the lowest one because it kind of goes right through the middle of the home, but that's that's natural grade. And so the exporting of um, 300 truckloads of, of soil rock cobble would occur at four feet down. Approximately 170 truckloads would come out with the had reduced two feet, um, and then approximately 30 truckloads would come out with the uppermost 529.5. Uh, additionally, um, the comment from the northern neighbor, uh, Mr. Hyman, was that the garage somehow was uh, creating the export of this dirt, or that um, somehow this was creating uh, a, a problem that we're trying to solve in a bunch of um, a bunch of ways, including moving a lot of dirt out. The garage itself is only 18 truckloads of dirt, which is half of our export. If we keep sympathetic to the natural terrain, when I went down to the city to talk to staff. I also looked at the aerial photographs that are outside the development service office. And there's one from, I think it's the incorporation date in the 1930s, which shows the photograph of Tokwitz Canyon. And Tokwitz Creek was emptying into the tennis club area. And you, if you see those two walls, the wall to the right of our proposed house, and there's, there's, there's two little lines, those two little lines indicate a horse trail. That horse trail on those old aerial photographs was actually where the Tokwitz Creek was traversing in the 1930s. If we jump to the 1950s, a levee is placed in there and the water starts moving down the current Tokwitz Creek, or at least in the 1990s when the uh, flood control district put, put the flood control improvements in. So the reason why these two sites are higher than the site across the street is the depositing of all of that uh, sediment, the alluvium, the, the boulders and all the other things that were coming out of Tacos Canyon 
in within the incorporation of the city. So this isn't uh, geologic time. This is this is within photographs that we can see in incorporation of the city. So there's a little mound that exists here. The mound we see fairly clearly with the house to the right um, it has a flat pad that's up, and then you see our proposed uh, our design with the existing pad, which is sloping off to the street. And that, that's a natural occurrence. So anytime we push this thing down further, we're just, we're, we're going against the natural terrain that we find today out on that site. And it's, it, it, it wasn't something that was necessarily created um, a long time ago. It was, it was created through just the natural process of the flows from Taquas Canyon. So I think this is an excellent illustration to just show what happens as the house goes down and the quantity of uh, truckloads of soil that have to get uh, removed from the site. Alex, if you can go to the site plan real quick. I just want to clarify something. In our design, if, if we push this thing down two feet, we have to take the driveway down a minimum of 32 inches uh, we've got to go down so that there's a slope back up into the driveway. So any water that would accumulate has to then go into some kind of drainage swale that we would have. So that that's one of the things that's forcing us to push the house back. Um, it's not only this portion of the house that would need to get pushed back, but the design is tied in at that um, entry tower. And the entry tower, the, the portion to the left, would have to move back as well. Uh, the pool... Um, we could modify some of the decking and things would need to get pushed back. Uh, the casita, we don't want to push back because that does then, you know, start to impact um, additional views. But once we push this thing down, there's just a whole series of consequences that, that um, we're, you know, we then have to deal with. So uh, just in conclusion, if we leave the home at the 5 uh, to 9.5, we have the fewest number of truckloads of uh, boulder, rock, and cobble moved from the site. And we, we're working with the natural topography as closely as possible. We're pushing the home as far towards the right-of-way in the street, which obviously there's a quite a distance between this home and the home across the street. So we feel that uh, the original proposal does give us um, the best uh, relationship with the existing topography. Are there questions for Lance? Commissioner Song. Mr. Lance, good evening. Um, what would you be opposed of keeping the elevation as you propose it, but setting the building seven feet further back to the west? Uh, what, um, what, what are we trying to solve? By, by pushing the uh, face of the building seven feet back, it, it creates a greater setback from the street. And therefore, the height that you're proposing in some ways looks diminished because there's a greater front yard. We consider that, yes. Okay, thank you. Hello, this is Peter here. Uh, I, I forget why did engineering want it to be lowered four feet? It was our understanding that uh, just a mathematical calculation of the pad height of the home to the south, the pad height of the home to the west, the new proposed vacant pad to the um, to the northwest, the home to the north. And then kind of confoundingly, they took two houses across the street, um, the house directly across the street, and then the house downhill across the street, aggregated those all together, and it arrived at about a four foot, um, four foot height reduction. I guess this is a question for staff quickly. Is that, is engineering typically um, the 
the entity that determines height uh, from in this regard it's not a planning department issue, it's, it's an engineering issue? They are ones who typically deal with grading issues and water management issues. And so both of those are directly related to pad height. So water management though, doesn't seem to be the issue primarily here, right? Because that's addressed. No, it does not. Okay, thanks. Alex, do you have that other view, the three-dimensional view that we also? The main house? Yeah, the main house from the street. So from the street, there was an additional exhibit that showed the three homes in a three-dimensional view from the street. I don't think I have that in here. No. Kathy, can we start deliberating? I think the commission is aware of the issues now. I think we can. Thank you, Lance. But I think the um, view he was referring to is the third page from the back, where the house is in the model is imposed on a picture of the neighborhood if anyone wants to look at that. Um, this is before the commission. And can we take this down so that I can see the commission? I can't tell when people want to speak. Okay, uh, is there, are there comments from the commission? Commissioner Irvin, is your hand up? No. Uh, Commissioner Roberts. Um, I think that um, staff, I mean, I think it's a nice house. I think it fits well into the neighborhood by and large. Um, you know, I think it was Commissioner Elaine asking about precedents based on letters we were getting from neighbors. The, the only precedent that I personally see happening here is subterranean parking which is creating a problem. It's pushing, it's pushing that side of the house up. I think without that, that side of the house would have dropped and it wouldn't have had the impact that it's having on its neighbor, causing the neighbor to be concerned. So, but if, if, if this is what the applicant and his client wants, I, I don't think it's terrible in this case. I think um, dropping the house two feet is probably a good compromise. Um, with respect to the roof deck, I have a little bit of a problem with that. I think that given this neighborhood, that roof deck has the potential to impact its neighbors with noise and with um, privacy. And I, I think it was good that they glassed in two sides of it, but it's really difficult for me to know if that glass on two sides is gonna solve it. You know, normally if in a, when somebody wants a roof top deck in a, in a tight suburban neighborhood, um, it would make more sense to me if they didn't have a lot of yard space because it would say that they need additional outdoor area for recreation and entertaining. But this house and the design offer a tremendous backyard, a beautiful, big, a backyard to entertain a lot of people, um, even for the scale of this house. And, um, you know, I guess, I, again, I understand that by putting the garage underneath, it gives them a ton more square footage and then more yards. So I think my instincts right now are to drop, drop the house by two feet and probably just eliminate the roof deck. But I'm open to my colleagues' feelings on this. Commissioner Hirschbein. Well, once again, I'd like to agree 100% with Commissioner Roberts on a 
I agree. The compromise of two feet is not affecting the dirt uh, haul out all that much. Uh, it placates, ameliorates some of the problems addressed by the neighbors. And I don't see any need for that roof deck. And I think it could be very intrusive into the adjacent yard. So I, I'm on board with Commissioner Roberts' comments, and I'd be willing to go to uh, a motion to that effect. So we have a motion and a second comment on it. Um, yes, Chair. I, yes. I am still open to the concept of a roof deck. Um, I think that there are way more roof decks uh, in the community than people realize. And I think that that is because over the years, Palm Springs has done a very good job of making sure that they, the roof decks where they exist, uh, same thing with the second floor and second floor balconies, are located such that they don't have good view into neighbors' yards. They don't cause problems. And as I was canvassing the areas, I was noticing that for each and every instance, there's a different situation. Um, a different potential problem that has been avoided by the location um, of the particular balcony or deck. And I think that the architect has done a good job here and has been, has prepared the exhibit showing the sight lines to demonstrate that this really is not going to be, give somebody an unfettered view into uh, a neighborhood, into a neighbor's yard. I think that if it was the intention of Palm Springs to not allow roof decks, they'd have codified that years ago. Do I think it's necessary? Yes, no, I don't think that anything is necessary. I don't think 5,000 square foot homes are necessary, but that's just me. But that doesn't mean that somebody who has um, the resources to be able to build large fancy homes with nice amenities uh, like X should not be allowed to do so. So I'm open to, I would certainly entertain the notion of approving um, the two foot lowering of the uh, slab of the finished floor level and, and, and the roof deck. Is that a substitute motion? No, I'm more just throwing it out there for discussion at this point to see if anybody else is uh, open to considering it. I'm, I'm also open as well. Um, I, I took a, uh, a walk, to, I mean, a drive through the neighborhood as well, and also seen the same thing with the roof decks and, and other places and other different things on top of homes. So I, I also will be open. Commissioner Song and Commissioner Maruzzi. Um, I I agree with uh, um, with dropping the two feet and keeping the roof deck because it does two things. It pushes the building uh, seven feet back, and then it allows for the rooftop to be really enclosed within the courtyard of the backyard. Commissioner Marusi. I agree with Commissioner Song. Okay, so we have um, we have a motion. Do you wish to change your motion given the the comments that you have gotten? Who made the motion? It's either you or um, Commissioner Hirschbein. I think Commissioner Hirschbein entertained it. I just want to add that I'm I'm swayed by the comments of my colleagues. It, uh, you know, I I just couldn't get a good sense of the impacts of that rooftop. But if they all feel pretty confident that it's not gonna have significant impacts on the neighbors, um, I'm okay with it. Um, I'm in agreement with um, Commissioner Lyons' sentiment. Um, so do I have a motion? Um, I'll make a motion to lower the house two feet um, and um, keep everything else as as proposed most recently. So you're you're including the rec the other recommendations of staff. 
Yes, unless we want to talk about them. I mean, the the um, the prolifera recommendation. I don't know where that was born, um, but the rest of the conditions don't seem unreasonable to me. And I will second that motion. Uh, is there any? Sure we, I'm not sure if the original motion was seconded, and if that's still on the table first. It doesn't appear that. Um, it just appears there was a motion, but not a second. So now we have a motion and a second. Is there any comment before we call the roll? Can you call the roll, please? Vice Chair Roberts? Yes. Commissioner Lane? Yes. Commissioner Urban? Yes. Commissioner Hirschbein? Yes. Commissioner Marusi? Yes. Commissioner Som? Yes. Chair Warmick? Yes. Motion is approved 7 0. Thank you. The next item before us is new business. Uh, item 4A consideration of submitting priorities, areas of focus for city council, for a city council visioning, city council visioning session. Um, does the planning director wish to speak on this? I will speak very briefly based on the lateness of the hour. Uh, just to give you a heads up, the city council is going to be holding a visioning session in November. They have requested that all of the boards and commissions forward priorities to them so that they can review those and include those as their priorities. My only purpose this evening is to have you start thinking about what the priorities of the Planning Commission may be in the upcoming year. I've given you a few suggestions on the uh, attached memo page that you have there. We will have a discussion of this on the 22nd, so you have three weeks to think about those. And with that, I will complete my comments and turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The next item is Planning Commission reports, requests, and comments. Are there any? There being none. Wait, wait, wait. I'm happy to see, <laughs> happy to see that Tova is coming down. I was out of town for two weeks, came back, and I saw the big pile of sticks and was very pleased. It's been an issue I've been talking about for two years. Um, Madam Chair, I just want to make a comment with respect to the item that shot by us very quickly, which was the council's request for priority. Um, I would like to hear from staff, um, not tonight necessarily, but I'd like to hear from staff on what they think is priority. And I think that coming specifically to the Planning Commission has merit and meaning. Trust me, we have opinions. <laughs> and, and we'll I be agree happy to share. That. I knew you would, Director. You always do. Uh, okay, that is a direction to staff to come forward with your recommendations. Uh, the planning director's report, and would you include in this any items that are up for review with the council? Mr. Newell, did you have anything before I launch into council items? Uh, so looking forward to the September 9th city council agenda, I do have two items coming forward from the planning division. Number one is a report on inclusionary housing. Commissioner Alayan was part of that work group and did some very vital research for us on the issue and just wanted to thank her publicly for her efforts in regards to that work group. Um, and then secondly, we also had another work group on the issue of parklet design guidelines, which will also be presented to the city council on September the 9th. Uh, and so those are the two items we have coming forward from the planning division at that meeting. Um, I don't believe we have any uh, other items uh, relative to cases that you've considered recently. Um, there is one item that was appealed and is going forward in October. I'll have additional information on that at your meeting on September the 22nd. Any questions of staff? There being none, I would like to adjourn this meeting until 530 
Wednesday, September 22nd, 2021. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.